My name is Andrew Dodge. I've spent the last 11 years getting to know some of America's most infamous criminals, such as serial killers, spree killers, mass murderers, gangsters, mobsters, and many more criminals. Unforbidden Truth will bring you interviews with not only these individuals, but also mental health professionals, survivors of violent crime, and professionals in other fields related to crime. This is the only place you will hear the murderers tell their own stories from their own mouths, uncut, unraw, which is the unforbidden truth. Welcome to Unethical Podcasts. Exactly. exactly. Hey, wait. I'm good. I'm fine. I'll tell people how old I am anytime. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm an old motherfucker. You know, I mean, it Same. is what it is. We're all, we all going to get old eventually. You know, I mean, for sure. It's, you know, the number doesn't matter. It's really just kind of how you feel more than anything else. It's like when it's definitely a mindset more than anything else until you start physically breaking down. And then you're like, <laughs> yeah. I'm now, old I'm old. now I'm old. Yeah. yeah. God, I am old. You keep uh, busy, man. You'll feel young forever. Working on a podcast that works the fuck out of your brain. No doubt. No doubt. It, Definitely. So true. So true. Uh, we got Bob Mata on the show today. I just want everyone to know. And I'm talking fucking Gacy with him because I'm excited for this. But you you and Darren do this by yourselves or your, your wife helps you with yours? I mean, Allison helps with like when we were starting the pod, she did like kind of all the shit that we needed to get done, like getting us on all the different platforms and uploading all the shit to the website. But in terms of like the creative and like the post-production and the production, yeah, it's, it's D and I, two-man show. So I do all the writing, the research, and, you know, obviously the hosting. And then D handles all the back end shit, you know, and puts together a fucking phenomenal pod. And I had my, like, it's, it's, it's basically a family affair. Okay. So Allison did like getting you guys hosted, not getting you guys set up like that. And then you had a guy do music, which we did too. At the end of the day, it's just you and Darren though. That's fucking Indeed, crazy. Man. You guys do a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, oh, the, crazy. Uh, the biggest thing Allison really did for me is that she let me basically like step away from the practice, you know, like our firm, oh. you know, to quit like that. Shit. Her buying me that fucking time was like priceless. It was fucking massive, you know, because if I was trying to like fucking work full time lawyering, I wouldn't have had the time. And she didn't even give me shit about it. You know, so I was like, I'm going to I'm going to fuck with this. I'm going to do this. And because it was funny when the pandemic started and i had always told her like over the years i had wanted to write a book i wanted to try to write like a a, like a true crime fiction book and so when the pandemic hit and they basically shut down the courts so that was like the first time in like 19 fucking years that i had like a minute to breathe and not be worrying about shit constantly so you picked up something that you have to you have no time to breathe and always worrying about it but yeah for you, Bob. i mean <laughs> fuck dude that was like a real fucking that that's like the nightmare of being a lawyer man so I, it was like i packed up the whole family i'm like we're not staying in fucking illinois and we like i rented a minivan and we went to arizona because i wanted to rent like airbnb with a pool so we could like swim through the like the entire fucking quarantine or like have a nice pool where it was 80 out every day and so we did that and then i started writing a novel and you know i was like halfway done with the fucking thing i think i had written like 250 pages so that's how she kept letting us stay out there because i was working on the book and then we came back but i was like so focused on you know this this idea that i had to do a podcast like two years prior been negotiating this thing with this company uh radical media where they were going to license the tapes and they were going to use them and i like i negotiated that thing for 10 months and i just couldn't get a deal done with them i couldn't get them up on the money 
and they just wanted the sound from the tapes. You know, that was it. There was like, I wasn't going to be involved in any way, shape or form. And so I ended up killing that deal. What are we talking, Bob? What did you turn down, buddy? Let's hear it. 35 grand. 35 G's. Yeah, no, fuck that. Smart move. Fuck that. Smart move for sure. So, yeah. And I, I was like, I, I can't do it. My dad was like, fuck it. Or right, you fuck that. <laughs> You know, I think he I think he sent an email, my, you know, packing one number at a time or one letter at a time on his computer probably took him four hours to draft it. And he sends it off and he says, we want three million dollars. I was like, well, that's going to kill the deal for sure. I was like, that, that's going to end that conversation. So uh, which it did, which oddly enough, Joe Berlinger, like is fucking ran with my idea, you know, cause it was like, I reached out to Joe Berlinger who's done like, he's got the Bundy tapes on that was on Netflix. And that, when that dropped that night, like, as I, I did not know that was coming at all. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, I have these fucking Gacy tapes. I said, I'm going to email this guy. So I Googled his name, found his fucking email address and sent him an email telling him that I had these tapes. And I think that they're way better than the things that you used for Bundy. Cause I was Bundy on death row, just pontificating and fucking a bunch of, you know, self aggrandizing bullshit. You know, it was like stupid. It was like, he wasn't saying anything interesting to me at least. So, you know, I was expecting Berlinger to get back to me or somebody on his staff, like maybe. And Berlinger ends up emailing me like five minutes later. He's like, Oh yeah, I'm super fucking interested in this. So after the deal died, I then go on to find out that he ran with my fucking idea and he's got this thing dropping on Netflix, I think in like two and a half weeks. So I, you know, when we found out that the evidence was planted and we're the only people that these cops ever told that fucking information to, like we literally uncovered that. So I started texting his producer. I'm like, yo, I'm like, I'm assuming you're going to want us because you're a documentarian. You know, we just changed the narrative of the Gacy case. It's like every the story that's been told for the last 43 fucking years was a lie you know they they got gacy on planted evidence that's how they got him it's a fucking massive story and then this guy like fucking crickets nothing so like i'm going to war with that motherfucker when that thing drops like for sure well you're yeah, dude he's just he's puking out the same shit when he knows and this wasn't like a theory i had the cops telling me this shit you know what i mean it wasn't like me pontificating and guessing it was like the cops are like yeah we didn't find the shit where they said they found it which was a big fucking deal the search where they get the bones like was based on the fact that they found that receipt in his house that was the connection yeah. between the two people peace and and gacy Celeste, do you know lots about the gacy case at all like do you know have you listener uh anything from gacy I am here to represent the unethical listeners that have not listened to Defense Diaries, because as I said to you before, I won't listen to anything until it's done. I've been waiting. You said at first, you're like, it's going to be 12 episodes. And I'm like, OK, yeah. I have to wait 12 <laughs> episodes. And I've just been waiting. And I'm like, nope, still not the last one. Nope, yeah. still not the last one. <laughs> yeah, thir 36 episodes later. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and so, 36 episode 36 is in three one and a half hour parts, Bob. That's Let's right. Be fucking honest. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It's it's uh we were very thorough. Let me let me yeah. just put it like that. It's an awesome podcast, man. Defense Diaries is fucking amazing. I, I I've listened to it twice now, once because I knew I was going to talk to you today, and the other one just out of pure fucking love for I love the serialized stuff like that. And you did a really good job of taking that genre, uh true crime podcast let's say, and like putting it from the, I'm a defense lawyer. I'm actually looking out for a fucking crazy asshole. I know there's a crazy asshole here, but he still has rights. Plus you, you also focused a lot on the victims and that, that didn't really happen as much in the Gacy stuff I've seen prior. So you, you guys did a really good job. Yeah. Thanks man. Yeah. Like when we went into it, it was the concept was to make Gacy like the background, you know what I mean? Like he wasn't going to be the fucking star of the show like he always is it's like that's been done over and over and over so but when i when i see people uh, posting online for your thing like at first people are like i saw a couple people in your actual facebook group going like i can't believe he's like defending gacy that's the, the thing i think it's most gripping about it is like you still play the defense lawyer right for a fucking monster right, right. Right. <laughs> Which is fucking cool, man. You guys did a great job of it. Uh, in terms of because like after the season was done, like when just when we finished it, like somebody they gave us a five star review, but they were like, I couldn't believe at the end that they were at like Bob actually thought that he was innocent by reason of insanity. And I'm like, I didn't. 
I never, no, I never said that. Not I once. never, I never said that. I like what I was trying to do was trying to, because like the entire time growing up when I'd have like people ask me like, how the fuck could your dad defend that guy? I'm like, well, number one, everyone constitutionally has a right to a defense. That's, it's not optional. It's like, it, it, it has to happen. And, and number two, it wasn't like they were trying to say that the guy didn't commit the crimes. It's like, they were trying to say that he was mentally ill, you know, and the fact of the matter is no one can say like my dad said it best. Like when I played his opening argument that he gave in court, it was fucking brilliant. And it was true. Every fucking word of it was true. Like at that time in 78, the DSM didn't have like a category for somebody like that. Like, like what the fuck do you call him? You know, yeah. he's not like a straight up, you know, psychotic because he can act normal all the fucking time. You know, but he's got this this drive like he wasn't able to conform his behavior. You know, so it's like now it's now that's that's like a what a sociopath less though. That'd be now someone who just. Yeah, that would be that would be considered as like. So when Rappaport, who was one of the experts, like he came up with the term borderline personality, he literally. So that guy, if it was towards the end, like in the trial, I had like a small clip of Richard Rappaport who's still alive. He's an old man now. You know, he literally came up with the term borderline personality in that case. It did not exist anywhere. It wasn't in the DSM. And that's what my dad was saying. He's like, there is no category for this, but we all know that he's abnormal. He is not normal. It's like normal people don't do this shit. Normal people don't live over 26 corpses for eight years. It's like they, they don't normal people don't do that, you know, but at the end of the day, like the fucking guy was the poster boy for the death penalty. There's no convincing anybody. And, and like I, I say it in the pod, as soon as the, one of their experts said that there was a chance that if Gacy would have been institutionalized, that if they made him right, <laughs> mentally that he had a chance of walking out the case was done <laughs> like like any normal yeah. person's like yeah n- no <laughs> like i Never, like, no, no no fucking way like there's yeah. there's zero percent chance of of me finding him not guilty by you know reason of insanity let's frame this for celeste because she doesn't know anything about this and for the listeners you haven't listened and for the listeners yeah yeah so let's let's go back a little bit first of all let's talk about your dad for a second he was the defense attorney or one of two I guess, defense attorneys for John Wayne Gacy, which is just in itself super interesting. Right. How old were you when that happened? 10. 10 years old? Ten. <laughs> You're like little... my kid's age? My, yeah. You met Oscar? You're yeah. like Oscar's age at that time? Yeah. I was a little motherfucker, oh man. Yeah, I was did I you... was a little kid. That's crazy. <laughs> did I? Did you even know what was going on? Like, I know, yeah. Kate, you told a story in the podcast where you said, you remember the moment your dad saw Amaranti, which was the other lawyer of Gacy's, on TV with Gacy and I guess they had his like civil lawyer with him, whatever that guy's name was. Yeah. Leroy Stevens. Yeah. Leroy. Your dad was like, I know that guy, but you were a 10 and you knew like you understood what was going on. Yeah. So like, so my parents had divorced when I was five. All right. So at that point, I think I had moved to Colorado, which at that time was very fortunate. Like I, I would not have wanted to live in the state of Illinois while my dad was defending him because kids are fucking cruel. And like, I would have been bullied. Like it would have been fucking fucking nonstop because it was like it was every day in the paper every day on the fucking news like everyone knew it was just that kind of a story you know so it's like if i so i was living in colorado and i had happened to uh it was my dad's christmas for visitation so i had flown in and it was like him and my uncle and i and he had like a little two-bedroom apartment and we were all sitting there on that night that the case broke and, you know, it hit the fucking news. And then, yeah, so Sam comes on the news. My dad's like, holy shit, I know that guy. You know, he's like, should I, should I, you know, reach out to him and see if he needs help? And this is way before texting and email and all that shit, man. So he legitimately, so I was like, yeah, man, like that, that would be amazing. You know, but from my perspective, I'm 10. I'm thinking, oh yeah, you could be a you know famous lawyer on the TV and shit. You know what I mean? Did you get bullied in Colorado after? In Colorado, no. People didn't know about John Wayne Gacy in Colorado. No. So when I when I yeah, they knew of him, but not like they would have in Chicago. It wouldn't have, yeah, they wouldn't have felt like it was in their own backyard. That would sting the statewide, yeah. Totally. It would have been night and day. So But when I moved back, like in the beginning of, I want to say it was like 82 or 83. So that's like two years after the case. Like I still was getting shit. 
So I, I can only go by the amount of shit that I got then, which wasn't like, and I was a pretty tough kid, you know what I mean? So I, I wasn't like, I would hold my ground pretty good, you know, and, and I'd give it back to people and shit. But, you know, if, if I had been living there then, like it would have been multiplied by probably a, a thousand, you know, it would just yeah. been like a daily fucking thing. Kind of what happens with defense attorneys, they take on, and it's not right because it's a job that has to be done, you know, and people hate the fucking lawyers as much as they hate the fucking criminals, man. It's like the people that are defending them. Like I get why people hate defense attorneys of like gangsters that fucking just get away with drug dealing and child zones and shit. Like I get that. Cause you're just yeah. getting paid a bunch to like get some guy off on whatever reason you can. But like, it's not like Gacy was paying your dad millions of dollars to defend him. You know what I mean? No. Like your dad must've done that for cheap. No, he got, I, I think in one of the last episodes, I said what they ended up making on it. It was like $24,000 for a case that took them that like that destroyed their practice, like zero time to handle any other things, which, you know, and my dad has always told me like, and told me when I told him, I was going to get into private practice. He's like, it's fucking feast or famine, Bob. You know, you can go three months without making a fucking dime. And then, you know, somebody will walk in the door and hire you and you get some money. And so it's like, no one's paying you. It's like anybody that's got their own business. You've got to, and with lawyers, they're a dime a dozen, you know, they're, they're, especially like in a bigger city, you're going to have like a million fucking other lawyers out there literally competing against you. That's, that's probably a good thing that he took Gacy then in that way, if there's so many, but then he's like, this guy here defended Gacy. He's got name recognition after that. Is that a thing? Like, am I right about that? Is that why he took the case? Basically any kind of ho like if you're trying yeah. to, to make a name for yourself when you're because my dad had just left the public defender's office like he had been with the PD's office probably for, I don't know, 15 years at that point. I think he was like two, two months out of having retired from the public defender's office and hung his shingle. So, yeah, man, I mean, there's no question you, you don't like as an attorney in private practice, you do not turn down a fucking high profile case like that. That's going to get publicity for you. You know, you know, and my, and my dad was a hell of a lawyer, you know, it's like out of the two lawyers, my dad had been like handling the felony division at, at Cook County, which is like the worst of the worst, you know, he had been doing it forever. So he was like well-trained and, and ready in trial work to handle a case of that magnitude. Cause Sam wasn't. Sam had never handled anything like that. And he had never been in, in a felony courtroom to that extent. Like my father, my father was by far the more experienced trial attorney out of the two, but Sam had the relationship with Gacy from a civil side. Like he had handled some other shit for him, like from his construction business. It was like when, when he, my dad came on, I gotcha. you know, my dad like had all the experience in the criminal arena. So, you know, Sam really relied on that. And, you know, that's like, like when you get deep into the podcast and you get to the trial and I have my father reading his opening argument, argument is not supposed to be what's happening in an opening statement. You're basically supposed to just be telling the jurors, this is what the story is. The state tells their version of the story and the defense says, this is what our version of the story is. And this is what you can expect to hear during the trial. My dad was really arguing the whole time. You know, if you listen to that and I explain that to people, because there's it's it's neither one is evidence, neither an opening or a closing. Yeah, it's super it's super well done. Like yeah. your dad's you could tell he's a smart, super smart guy just from that. I, I just find that such a different way to grow up. It's so like, you know what I mean? Like you do you have lots of lawyers in your family. Is it just your dad? Like my dad. But so why would you get into it? Because your dad is your dad like your hero. Oh, yeah. Like were you like, I need to be a lawyer for sure. Like that was it, man. It was like, yeah. and that's why I got into criminal defense too. You know, it's like, and how long have you been a lawyer now? Uh, let's see, I graduated in 21 years. Jesus. You've had a full yeah. career too. You know what I mean? Like full career. Lots going on there. Yeah, dude. Like I, I, you know, I was ready to step away from it when I, when I did, you know, it was like, I, I was more than ready to, to change my path because I just wanted to do something that made me happy, you know? Cause like practicing law in general is a brutal profession. It's like, Everyone hates their fucking lawyer. No one wants it. Like you're, you're always dealing with people on their worst day. Yeah. When you're, when you're dealing sure. with a lawyer, you know, if you're, if either, if you've committed a crime, you know, you're looking at, at prison time. If you've been injured in an accident, you know, that person, if they've been severely injured, they're dealing with that. If you're getting fucking divorced, everything is misery in the law. Like, like literally the only thing I can think of is like adoption. 
<laughs> is like one happy area that maybe little lawyers work and and maybe like when the real estate market's good and people are closing on houses like those well. are literally the only two times that I can I can think of that you know that there's somebody that's walking away happy and like the rest of it is fucking misery and to be a criminal defense attorney, I'm dealing with strict misery. How long was your dad a lawyer for? Like, he's retired, obviously, now, no? Uh, yeah, I mean, he he tinkers with it a little bit. I, I'd say he kind of retired, really, from the criminal trial practice when he he tried the case that we're doing the second season on, the Anthony Garcia yeah, yeah. case. He tried that with me. It was the only case I ever tried with my dad. So he started law school the year that I was born. That's crazy. The reason I'm even I'm even asking is because like your dad has like 40 plus plus you have 20 plus and then your dad comes at you. How old are you with these fucking tapes? Like he comes at you with like what? 12 tapes of him. 15 tapes. And I was it was my 21st birthday. There you go to me. They like he had a like big party. I had a bunch of buddies there and family and all that shit. It was at this Mexican restaurant and he hands me the box and I didn't even know he had them. Like I didn't know those were something that he had. And, you know, he didn't didn't tell me he was giving them to me and just fucking presented them to me. And I, they were wrapped and I opened it. And I'm like, I see on the box it was scribbled Gacy tapes and, and I didn't listen to him forever. Oh, really? That was going to be my next question. You didn't even pop one and you weren't like, what's the clown eating? What is he eating? Is he yeah. like KFC in his fucking yap right now? Let's hear this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I i did i did pop one in at the behest of like some of my buddies so like a few of my buddies were like dude i want to hear the fucking tapes let's put the tapes in so like we went one day i went and i grabbed the box and they were up in my closet and i put one in and we listened i think to probably like 20 minutes of the first tape which is where gacy's talking about the first kid he killed and and that was it. And then I didn't listen to him until I digitized. Okay, wait, 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 like, wait, slow down. You're going way too fast past that moment. That's a so you listen to him talking about killing a kid and then your friends yeah. were like, keep going, bro. Or are you like, no, nah, <laughs> this is sad. Let's turn this off. This is bad news. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I'm good, man. I'm good. You know, it's and your like, buddy kept wanting you to go. That's what I'm saying. Like, was the mentality in the room? Did it bring the room down? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it was like it was like a bunch of like 21 year old guys so no it was like everyone was like fucking wanted to hear it you know what oh, i mean because it was just like it was so fucking weird man you know and it was like no one had ever heard the shit it was just it was unusual man for for certain and it was an unusual gift that i just sat on forever not knowing what to do with them and then okay so wait before we go i before we go i got more questions about the box so your dad wraps you up in a box Inside, there's 15 tapes. Are the tapes like numbered or are they just like dates? Like the the question I'm asking is, do you think you, your dad got some fucking really horrendous ones that he just didn't give you? He's like, fuck that. I'm not giving those ones. No. Yeah, I think I think everything he had, he gave me. I think went because my dad would always go to talk to Gacy alone. Like it was my father and Gacy, like except for the first tape, Sam's on there. But every other tape, every other time my dad went, it was just him and Gacy. But I think Sam went a few times because like Sam was saying that he had tapes, which he doesn't have. Are you sure? Are you sure he's not thirty five thousand dollars richer? Are you sure he's not just thirty five thousand no, dollars richer? <laughs> no, because like it, like th those tapes were like a real big fucking like fight between my dad and Sam. Like when Sam wrote his book, because Sam wanted oh, those yeah. tapes and he wanted you going to digitize them and then he was going to include them. Because and, and my dad was like, Where, "Where's your fucking tapes? You know, where's the tapes that you have?" Yeah, fuck that. That's my legacy. Fuck off, Sam. That was exactly the conversation. I'm not saving for Bob Jr. This is what he gets for an inheritance. Leave him alone. Right. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're taking podcasts off his plate. That's eerily accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, how weird would that be for Sam? Like, if he knew Gacy, like, professionally, like, oh, hey, hey, buddy. What's up? How you doing? 28 bodies, huh? Well, yeah, OK. I'll That's set up exactly how it went down. Like AC shows up at his office the way that legend has it, like on the 20, the 20th going into the 21st of December, sits in Sam's office because like he had talked to Sam a bunch during that 10 days when they were following him around. You know, he's like, oh, I don't know why they're fucking following me around. It's like I'm fucking just a businessman, blah, 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 blah. And then I think Gacy was starting to feel like they were closing in and they really weren't. That's the irony of it. Like, but Gacy felt like they were after I disclosed the whole thing about the, the receipt. I then explained to people, I think in episode nine or 10, like why 
they did what they did at that exact time. And that was because, well, let me, let me jump back. So well, yeah, so, that's what I mean, let's go, we'll get to that. Yeah. So gate, so Gacy ends up fucking like going to Sam's office on the 20th. He's like, do you have any booze? And, and Sam pulls out a bottle, pours him a coffee cup full of like fucking wild Turkey fucking Gacy pounds it and starts spilling allegedly, you know, that he fucking killed all these, these kids, man. And, and, you know, spends like, six hours confessing fucking gets hammered falls asleep on sam's thing he's got the two cops sitting out in the foyer of the office while gacy's in there he doesn't give him a specific number when he's spilling he just says i killed a bunch of kids that peace kid he's like that peace kid is in the river i know he said the peace kid but sam claims that he said that he killed at least 30 okay that's what he that's what he claimed, you know, but the thing about that conversation is it wasn't recorded, you know, and, and the whole wouldn't thing, that be the fucking tape? Oh, you'd be a you'd be a billionaire. Ooh. Yeah, that would be the fucking tape for sure. But I, I don't think Gacy ever, ever did that, you know, and that and that's kind of my thing with Gacy is like I, I kind of believe him that he I think he went into this 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 mental thing where he didn't really recollect what he was doing, man. He'd wake up with a fucking body there because there were too many people that survived Gacy where when they described when Gacy was attacking him, that he just changed like he, like his eyes, like everything about him, like changed. I don't know what your parents were like when you were a kid, but you know, you're like parents are in normal mode and then you'd like break something. And then they would like their face would like that happens. People change. Yeah. But this, this wasn't like rage type shit. It was like, like there, I, I talk about it like during the trial about one of the guys that testified, I think his name was Michael Reed. And he was a guy that had lived with Gacy for a few months. You know, they were in the garage working together and like, they weren't in an argument. They weren't, they weren't fucking, they weren't having sex. There was nothing like that going on. And all of a sudden out of nowhere, Gacy picks up a hammer and fucking hits this guy in the head once and it, it doesn't knock him out. And he's like, he looks up at, at Gacy. He's like, he's like, what, what are you doing? You know, he like starts screaming yeah. and saying, stop, stop. And like, you know, when he describes the way that like G Gacy, like looked like a fucking blank slate, like his eyes, his eyes were dead, you know, great white shark, just black eye thing going on. And he's like, it was like looking at a different person. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, when I'm raging on my kids because they fucking did something wrong, that's different. And I remember it. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, you could always say you don't remember. It. Yeah, you, I'm sorry. You don't have to always not remember. Like, you're the only one who knows whether or not you actually remembered something. And if it's in your benefit to say I didn't remember something, what are you going to say? Obviously, you're going to say I don't remember it. Totally. But like he remembered the first one. You know what I mean? It's like there, there's almost no benefit to him. He remembers like five of them. Like where he explains like the five that, that are in my tapes that yeah. he remembers, one of them is enough to get the death penalty. Yeah. And once you spill out one, like point is, is that there's no advantage to him to be pretending like he doesn't fucking remember it. Cause like if, if you listen to the tapes and I played a majority of them during the podcast, the entire time my father is trying to trick him into fucking up, like playing, he's playing your role. I ain't buying it, dude. Like I, I'm not fucking buying what you're selling me. Yeah. I know that you can fucking remember. So you need to fucking, you need to tell me it's like this defense we're putting forward is requires me to fucking know what you did. He, he never got him to crack. And my dad came at him every single way that he could to get him to basically start spilling it, man. So it's like, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it as we go. Cause like, so we got your tapes, you have tapes now and you had them for how many years before you fucking looked at them again? 25 at least. And then you decide I'm going to make a podcast with these, which is a great idea, by the way. Uh, yeah. Okay. So then you just start looking at these tapes. You've called Darren. How do you know Darren? Darren's your producer. How do you know him? I had met Darren through my other buddy who was in the music industry. He was a producer. He put together like fucking super dope shows. I had met him and Chris had introduced me to Darren because Darren always did his sound like, Allison and I would go down for jazz fest and Chris would always put on these amazing shows during jazz fest. And like over the years, I developed my own relationship with Darren. It's not like he was in law school with you and flunked out. And he was like your little like buddy that was your stoner friend or something. No. That would have been funnier. No, uh -uh. like <laughs> I, I met Darren. I know. Yeah. I met Darren like later in life. Like he was one of my, my later in life friends. That's cool. Like we connected, like when we first met, like we had, you know, big bromance type shit. 
Darren would kill me. You know, he'll kill me when I when I when he hears that I said that. But <laughs> Darren's not a bromance type of guy. But uh, yeah, but we we you know we clicked. We we liked each other. We could tell we were kind of of the same mindset. So like when I decided to start doing it, and I had no fucking idea from the technical side at all how to create a fucking podcast. So I bought a bunch of whack equipment, like super cheap shit. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, I'm gonna fucking sit. I put it all on a little table down in my basement. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna start fucking with this thing. And I, I realized like in five minutes, I'm like, there's no fucking way I'm gonna be able to do this. You know, when I decided to do the podcast, I was gonna I wanted to put out a quality podcast. I didn't want to put out a piece of shit. You know what I yeah. mean? I didn't want it to sound like a piece of shit. I saw I saw your first one of your first posts on the internet being like, I got these Gacy tapes, I'm making a podcast. And I was like, follow this guy. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> dude. And so I was like, I think I had to like already had my dad come down to the basement and I tried to record him like, and like I, I hit some setting and it fucking chopped the entire interview into like 30 second segments, <laughs> for like three hours oh, of 30 seconds. I'm like, I don't know what I did. And like, so I'm like, so I start racking my fucking brain. I'm like, man, I'm like, who the fuck could I get? I'm like, I know so many people in the music industry. And then like, immediately it popped into my head like the second it popped in my i'm like darren because darren and i had been talking about doing something like something together this is in the middle of the pandemic so the music industry was fucking dead you know his entire livelihood had shriveled up and he was making nothing so like for me it was a godsend that's perfect that's what i mean you've had tape this is what i was trying to say like this is where i'm trying to go with this you got these crazy tapes that are like a gold mine for any true crime podcast would love fucking you know we've got people asking you for them for probably years and then darren who is also an amazing sound guy just falls into your lap and then you guys just wanted to make a uh gacy podcast and right why not right let's do that people are interested in gacy right and then you guys fucking break the gacy case like you broke it. Right. You broke it in half. It's I know. the same we anymore. Fucking broke it. It's not the same <laughs> anymore. You guys it. fucked it up. And I know. For Celeste's Crazy. sake, I, I don't want to give away too much of the podcast, but I am going to give away a bit. Do you mind if we talk about the whole process of like peace and how the fucking cops? No, dude, totally. Okay. Yeah. No, of course. Yeah. So I don't, Celeste doesn't know anything. And if you guys don't know anything out there, basically how Gacy got caught and correct me when I'm wrong in this entire thing, uh, Bob Gacy was, I guess he was out at some pharmacy in Des Plaines and he was over there bugging the boss to see if he wanted to do some fucking renovations. Uh, I guess the guy's name is Torf. What's his first name? Yep. Phil. Larry. Larry, Larry Torf. Larry Torf. Larry Torf. Torf is an awesome name. They were the Torf brothers. Oh yeah. <laughs> there were two Torfs. There, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Torf squared. Yeah. So he yeah. goes into there and like he's annoying the fucking guy there. Can I get I'll 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 uh hey guys, I'll come in here and I'll fix up all your shop. Whatever you want me to do, I'll come in and do it. Hey, you want some KFC? Anyways, he's such a fat weirdo. Uh so he comes in, he tells them that, and then the guys, I don't know if they were yeah. interested or not or whatever, but he's also yabbing along about how he hires young guys to come in and do it for five dollars an hour. And it'll get done properly because I'm in charge. These guys will learn from me. I'm the best at this. And then right. he kind of left. And then this guy that was right. working there, this kid, I don't know, he was 16 at the time. 15 going on 16. Yeah, yeah 15 at the time. And he his name was Robert Peast. And he was he heard Gacy talking, overheard. And he's like, fuck this. I'm going to go talk to that guy because $5 right. an hour is double what I make now, you know? exactly peace runs i guess this was about eight o'clock and at night his shift was done at nine o'clock so we had about an hour in between like thinking about this yeah closer to nine because his mom had just got there to pick him up that's right like, peace mom just arrived at the pharmacy to pick him up so he goes out to go talk to his mom go like it was her birthday or something so they're going to some party so he goes up to talk to her right. and he goes mom i'm gonna go see a guy there's a job that's available uh, i'll be right back he says, I'll be right back, I guess, to her. Right. Because I guess he, what does he do? Go around the building or something? Like, how does she not know exactly where he is? So the way that it plays out. So Mrs. Peace came in to the pharmacy. So I see Rob overhears the conversation. And, you know, and, that, and that's Gacy. Gacy saw Rob. Rob was a really good looking kid. He was just Gacy's type. So like his Gacy had been there twice. He had been there earlier at like six o'clock. Sees fucking Rob working. Leaves. Forgets his fucking appointment book. When I say forgets for people out there in audio world, I'm putting air quotes because he didn't forget shit. He, he didn't forget shit. Yeah. He, right. He left it there he gets home torf calls him says hey you left your fucking bible here was which is what gacy called his appointment book 
So Gacy waits until 8.15 because it's about a 15-minute ride to drive back to the pharmacy. Hang around in there till like right around when fucking Rob's getting off because the pharmacy closes at 9. Oh, there you go. So that was where I was confused. Okay. Every, yeah, everyone's getting off at 9 because that's when the fucking pharmacy hours are ending. So Gacy, like it, it like yeah. three minutes to 9. And, and in the meantime, Mrs. Peace gets there to pick Rob up to drive him back home because they're having a party at the house. So everyone's in the pharmacy. Yeah. Gacy's the first to leave. So he leaves and he's sitting out there like and he's he's again talked about this job opportunity for a summer job where he hires these young guys to make good money during the summer, five to seven bucks an hour. Rob's all over it. So he goes out there and he's fucking sitting in his car right out front. So Rob, when his mom comes in, he's he's putting his jacket on. He says, mom, he's like, wait here for a minute. I, I just got to go talk to this guy about a fucking job. And so he leaves. Everyone hears him say, I'm, you know, I'm going to talk to this contractor about a job. I'll be back in a minute. Runs out. That's the last they ever see of him. So no one ever sees him get into Gacy's car. No one ever sees him. at. Gacy's I always car. wondered if why nobody could see him because I know his mom's out there waiting. Yeah. Well, no, she was in the store. That's why she didn't see. I it. see. So he go, he runs out, gets in with Gacy and Gacy does what he does, fucking right. kills the fucking kid, well, Ga- basically. Right? Yeah, Gacy tells him that he doesn't have the applications with him, that they're at the house. He says, look, he's like, how much time do you have? Rob's like, you know, my mom's waiting in there, like not much time. He's like, he's like, well, he's like, let's swing by my house. We'll do an application real fast and I'll get you right back here. It'll take fucking 15 minutes. So I'm like 10 minutes away from here. So a piece at least allegedly agrees. You know, I mean, we don't know. Exactly. However, he gets him to his house. Uh, he's gone. And then Mrs. Peace right. is at the store waiting for fucking like an hour. Right. And she's like, where the fuck did he go? Right. Heads right to the police department, puts in a missing person report. Correct. That's where we're at of this. Exactly. Uh, 1030. So an hour and a half. He hasn't been gone long. Right away. Like her, her kid is not fucking running away. Her kid's not ghosting on her birthday. Like some, something is wrong. She knows it immediately. Yeah. Like this is a, her kid is not the kid who's gonna flake off on her fucking birthday while she's waiting at the store yeah one of the big things about peace in my opinion for the listener is that he was like like he wasn't like the other victims of gacy he was more like he had a people who loved him and wanted him around like people were interested as to where he was an hour and a half in right so i immediately yeah so this is what fucked gacy in the end because his mom went to the De Plain police department did she talk to cozen's act right away i think so yeah there's a lieutenant from the police department uh, in De Plain. his name is lieutenant cozen's act and cozen's act i don't know if he knew them but he knew his kid went to the same school as robbie exactly so i guess he jumps in right away and he goes fuck this let's figure out what's going on here and he looks up gacy or does he look up Gacy right away? They call him. They figure out who the guy was that he was doing. Right. Yeah. That, that night, like when she comes in, he has, he calls Ron Adams. Who's in the, uh, like he's in, he's in the juvenile division and says, look, you know, we think we got this missing kid. And that link between the fact that his son went to the same school and was in the same grade as Rob got Cozen Zach very motivated to fucking crack this thing. Like immediately, says he's like run the run this fucking guy's background uh it that, well let me take that back i i think that happens first thing in the morning because everyone was probably gone at that time when she came except i think kozenzak might have been there that following morning he, he calls adams adams finds out in pretty short order like they the first call that takes place is to larry torf and they say who's the fucking contractor like what's the guy's name exactly yeah. and torf's like it's gacy so they they get his name. Kozenzak tells Adams to run the name. He does. He gets a ding in Iowa that he was arrested on a sodomy charge. And he also had uh, he had charges out already for him, didn't he, in Chicago? Like he had for open battery charges? Yeah, he had a couple of battery cases. But the sodomy thing is what? A kid, a 15-year-old kid, right? Wasn't it a same age? Yeah, another 15-year-old kid that he got 10 years on. You know, so they knew it was like some serious shit, you know, because back then, like that sodomy law existed because like in 78, they didn't think that men could be raped. Like, that's not how they looked at it. Like, they didn't look at sexual assault, criminal sexual assault like that in terms of man on man, like sexual assault. They didn't consider it to be rape. That was like a 
almost exclusively a man to a woman, a man rapes a woman. Yeah, of course. So that, the way sure. that they kind of, yeah, which is crazy. You know, sure, fucking why? insane. But yeah, well, because that, that, that was the time. I know. I hate that. That was the time. It's still stupid. It's, it's annoying. Oh, my God, dude. I, I rip on that. Like, well, you know, you've listened to the pod, man. I'm, 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 I'm pretty fucking tough on that aspect of it, man. Yeah. So, yeah. So they, you know, they, they ended up putting two and two together pretty quick. You know, Rob goes missing on December 12th. They have a search warrant by the 13th to look at fucking Gacy's house. So they get into his house on the, you know, basically the first full day piece has been missing. Is that, that's gotta be rare, right? That's gotta be super rare. I wanted to ask you about that. Like from going from like, kind of just having a guy that w- walked in they said he's gonna get a job the next day getting a search warrant on his house they must have really had fucking thought he was the guy right away like they must have thought he was with them cozen zach immediately thought it was him and more importantly mrs peace knew it was him she's you know what i mean it's like she knew her kid she's like this kid is not fucking disappearing off the face of the goddamn earth yeah like there's something happened and it was with this guy that she said or that Rob said he was going to talk to. It's that simple. Find out who that fucking guy is. That's where Rob's at. She knew immediately and she got Cozen's act to the mindset that he knew immediately that Gacy was the fucking guy. So immediately they go in and and because, you know, to get a warrant in the United States is you've got to get in front of a judge. You have to have probable cause to say that we believe that a crime has been committed. Okay, it's not like a free for all and it's not a rubber stamp type thing because warrants are attacked by defense attorneys immediately. It's like you have to have actual probable cause. So what they had at that point is that they had that Rob had been in the pharmacy, said, I'm talking to this contractor. He fucking vanishes. And then they had this ding that Gacy, you know, was a sodomite. (laughs) You know what I mean? So they had those two things. And this judge Marvin Peters felt that it was enough. At that point, they weren't considering it to be a murder. They were considering it to be an abduction. Yeah. So they're just looking for him. They wanted time was of the essence. They're looking for Rob and anything else that they find in there isn't on the warrant. Right. Exactly. I'm very detailed. And that's one of the things I do in the, you know, as a criminal defense attorney, I'm trying to educate like all the true crime fans out there that listen to true crime shit. Cause like, if you watch discovery ID shit and it's like, they never tell you how the fucking system works. You know, they just assume that people understand how the shit works. And a majority of people don't, unless you're a fucking lawyer, you work in the system, you know, you hear about motion to quash and you don't know what the fuck it means so i made it a point in the podcast to try to explain to people exactly how the process works and what you need to do in order to get you know a search warrant and and how specific the search warrant has to be it's the constitution matters here it's like kind of like our you know it's it's the bible of the the legal game yeah which which makes sense right if you're got police coming into your house you don't want you don't want them kicking your fucking doors in you don't want them being able to search your house without looking for the thing they're looking exactly. for exactly like oh we're they, gonna, it has to be what's off yeah we're the gonna warrant. destroy your entire fucking house and we don't really know what we're looking for but you know it's, so it doesn't work like that you have to be sp- very specific as to what you're looking for, which ends up being like one of the big things I kind of focus on in terms of what happened after yeah. that search, you know? So what do they go in? They find uh, a ring with J A S on it. It's a, a high school ring from some like 1975 graduation ring. They find uh, what some weird underwear that doesn't fit Gacy. They're skinny underwear, not fat boy underwear. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> which is interesting. They find what do they find? They got a piece of rope, piece of rope because Gacy loved his fucking rope yeah. trick, weirdo. They found a bunch of books like Kill All the Pretty Boys. Oh, the pettery books, yeah, a bunch of like kind of uh, like, did- like gay books. I think on that first search, they found one pair of hun- or uh, one pair of handcuffs, and then of course, what they don't find. But what they claim they found was the, the photo receipt. So they, they didn't really find it there, but that became the story forever that they did. And that became the link between the fact that they are claiming that peace was in that house and that's how they proved it. Yeah. Okay. Stop for one second. Cause we didn't even talk about that. So when Pete that day, when Gacy was there, uh, when he picked up Peace, there was another girl working. Her name's Kim Byers. And she was working the cash and she was fucking cold because door kept opening and closing and she kept freezing. Right. So she asked Robbie if she could borrow his coat. Meanwhile, while she borrows his coat, she goes and puts in some film or whatever right. to get developed. And she has the receipt for that. And she's like, I'm wearing a coat. I'm going to stuff that in the pocket. Or that's what they say she right. did. Right. So she takes this receipt, puts it in the pocket. And then when they find that receipt magically at Gacy's house, it's not even uh, <laughs> there. Uh, Bob found out it wasn't there the whole right. time. But that's how the entire, that's how they got their second warrant to go actually look for fucking 
where he is because now there's a connection. So this, sorry, can I interrupt just yep. like a yes, couple please. of things real quick? Please. First of all, so just to confirm, this is what the piece of evidence that tied, like th this had no business being in Gacy's possession because these were not Gacy's photographs. This was another patron of the pharmacy. The receipt happened to end up in his, in Robbie's jacket pocket. And logically the only way it could have been there is if Robbie had left it there. Or if Gacy had Robbie in his house and he, of course, killed him and his jacket was there and then theoretically trying to get rid of any evidence that Rob Peast was there, he would have cleared out the, the contents of his pockets and then disposed of the jacket. So this is how they definitively tied the victim, which pertained to this warrant to the home, because all the other evidence of any other young men is irrelevant. Nailed it. Exactly. Boy, it, it exactly. almost sounds like you actually have listened to my podcast. You're a fucking, <laughs> you're a fucking quick study, Celeste. You're going to, you're going to love my podcast. I guarantee it. That's how the story went. Meanwhile, while this is all happening, they don't even know that the photo receipt is relevant right. yet. They just have it. Uh, and then they've also find that ring, like I said. So they start looking into this fucking ring and they're trying to get another way into Gacy's house. This is what I'm trying to say. Right. So they don't really have anything, but they can't really use any of that stuff. But they have photos of it. Uh, they have photos of a television. That was the other thing. They took photos of everywhere in there. Nowhere is there a photo of that photo receipt, right? There's not a photo from that day of the receipt, is there? Of course Bob? not. <laughs> no, of course not. You know, we may have some younger listeners out there, like some, you know, millennial type listeners who may not know who Gacy is. And just so Gacy, like a real brief, he was eventually convicted of murdering 33 young men ranging from, you know, 24. And I think his youngest victim was 14. Um, you know, he, he'd raped all of them. Uh, he murdered all of them and he disposed of all their bodies, 26 of which were buried in his crawl space under his house. Kind of his, his infamous moniker is he was the killer clown because Gacy enjoyed clowning, meaning he'd get up in full clown get ups and, you know, full face makeup, the full, <laughs> full clown costume. He'd go entertain children at uh, children's hospitals. He'd go to, you know, different events and clowning outfits. And he, he liked clowning. He had a clown license and he was a clown. Yeah, he was a fucking clown. He had a license to clown. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, he had, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He had a professional license to clown. He's like 007, except for the fat. Person. Right. He he really loved clowning. So, you know, he got the killer clown moniker. Now, he wasn't he wasn't killing people while dressed in clown garb, at least that I know of. You don't know that that, you know, of. right. Allegedly. I mean, he could have been. He does. That's true. I don't know. that. I, I mean, fucking I know he did one. He must have done. He, one. I, like it, he must have gotten in the clown outfit. I tend to one. agree with you there, actually. I think that I, yeah, <laughs> I really do. That's how he fits so many in his crawl space. Is he put exactly. them in like clown getups first because you can fit infinite clowns in a small space. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so that's kind of who like Gacy was. And, you know, that went on from, they claim, at least that we know of at this point, that, you know, that he killed the 33 victims over a, a six year period from 1972 to 1978 when he finally got caught. And like Richard was saying, he had a certain MO now, like he had two MOs actually, he had one MO where he would pick up these boys who were kind of like wayward souls who had been out and like street hustling back in the day, you know, either sex for money type things, you know, there was this area called bug house square where he would frequent and he would go out and troll and pick these kids up, bring them back. Some of them he murdered, some of them he didn't. You know, there, there's a lot of kids out there that escaped him. Um, and then his other MO was to, under the guise of, hey, I've got a job. You know, you don't want to work for me. Yeah. I pay you pretty good money. He, so it was like, those were the two MOs and that he would collect all these kids. And, you know, oddly enough, there were actually, as I dug into the case, you know, there were kids before peace. Like, because it always appeared that the peace case was the one that kind of broke the the case wide open because Mrs. Peast was like the first mom adamantly looking for her child immediately. And that's just not a fact as early back as 75 with his third victim, John Bukovich, his fucking father called the Chicago police once a week for two years, telling them, begging them to look at fucking Gacy and they didn't do anything. I hold the Chicago police fully responsible for 22, at least 22 of those fucking kids should have been alive. If the police would have done their job. That's what you say though. in the, in the, podcast is the fact that it's not uh, the fact that it happened in displays is what really changed the narrative of the thing because it, in chicago they just said fuck this shit but the displays police 
were all over it because that's where Robbie got taken from. And it, we're at the penultimate of this. We're at when he got busted. This was his last victim, right? We, we kind of, you're right. We did breeze over that. But yeah, so they didn't even have nothing to arrest him. Right. I mean, they, they went in on the search. They didn't find anything that would have allowed them to place him under arrest. You know, I mean, that's the proof in the pudding that they needed more, that they were desperate to get more. So they put that 24 hour, you know, seven day a week fucking tail on him, hoping that he'd fuck up. You know, but Casey wasn't a fucking idiot. You know, it's like he, he obviously stopped killing during that 10 days. So they never fucking saw him doing anything untoward or criminal. Well, mine is driving like an asshole. <laughs> right. You know, that was it. You know, so like, but but they just didn't have enough to get back in that house. Gacy was talking to Amaranti during this 10 days. He's like, you got to get these fucking guys off me. You know, he's like, I'm just a businessman. They're fucking with my business, man. They're fucking with my life, you know? So once they, they started putting pressure, I just want people to understand that. But the displaying police started tailing him 24 hours a day, two different police. Plus, they were going around bugging all fucking Gacy's like everyone he knew. He was getting frustrated with the police. So he goes to Amaranti and goes like, I want to file fucking suit against the police, even though he's a fucking murderer. Like, duh, like they're fucking following you. You know why, right. you asshole. But he's like, man, I want him $750,000. Right. Man. So he, he he tells Sam to, you know, get a, a federal suit filed. And the money side of it didn't matter at all to the displays police. What mattered is the, the portion of the lawsuit that they were seeking to have a restraining order against the displays police to stop the surveillance, which Gacy was going to win. Like I have, there's zero doubt in my mind in federal court. Sorry. That's the thing too. We gotta, we gotta mention because sure they had that going on the civil thing to stop it but also at the same time the police did have photos of that ring and they but they're not allowed to use any of this stuff because it had nothing to do with it was not their case exactly so they knew shit was going on so they wanted to hammer this fucking guy it's exactly what celeste said anything that they found that wasn't related to robert peace did not matter to them in terms of relevance in terms of being able to get in front of a judge saying we have more probable cause to get back in there because it wasn't their fucking case. It wasn't Robert Peace. Clearly, JAS are not Robert Peace initials. So anything that they you know may have found that that clearly indicated that this guy was not a normal cat. You know, he had some shit going on. Didn't help them in order for them to walk into court again and get a second warrant. So they were at a fucking standstill when they file that that federal petition to go in. You know, they've got Terry Sullivan over there who of course has refused to come onto the pod along with Kim Byers. And now I, you know, we, we didn't know why in the beginning, but we knew why after the cops told us what they told us, Terry Sullivan saying they're going to win this fucking thing. They're going to, which would have shut the investigation down. If the federal court would have said, yes, you are restrained from following this man anymore because on its face, Gacy was like a very successful businessman. You know, he, he made, 250,000, which like equates to today's money to like almost a million bucks. Like the guy was fucking crushing it, doing like what he was doing. And they didn't find anything during that 10 days. So you've got a guy who's being hounded for 10 days straight, you know, and you're going to walk into a federal court and his attorney is going to argue they have to stop. Like, how long can this go on? Is it going to go on until, you know, so the federal court, I am a hundred percent confident that you know, Terry Sullivan told them, look, you've got to get this guy under fucking arrest because when he goes into federal court on Monday, this thing, it's over. So if you don't get him now, it's done. So at this point, they have nothing to get him either. Right. So they what do they do? They sit down and they all go, how are we going to get this guy? Right. Is that what we think happened? I think after hearing your shit, I think they sat down in a room of like three or four guys that were like Sullivan might have been there. I don't know. Kozenzak was for sure there. And maybe somebody else was like, let's how are we going to do this? Yeah, no. So the the way that I think that it went down, it was Kozenzak, Mrs. Peast. Uh, Ron Adams, That's the uh, Ron saying. Adams, who was Kozenzak's right hand man. Like Ron Adams was the only guy that was in the know. Like every guy, every other guy that we interviewed for the podcast, every other cop, they were the fucking guys on the street, man. And this is like 78. They didn't have like any of the technology that they have now, even to communicate like this is pre cell phone. Young people listening to the podcast now probably have never seen a fucking pay phone. Like, honestly, you know, they used to be on every yeah. fucking corner. They used to be at, like on the outside of every convenience store. You had pay phones. 
Like we named our fourth episode pocket full of dimes because that was like one of the cops said, I always had a pocket full of dimes to make fucking phone calls. The communication between the guys on the street who were out investigating was non-existent with Cozen's. I, I, I'm with you. I legitimately think it's three or four people. Totally. So and they all sat down. In a room. And I'm 100% confident on this. I'll say 99.9% confident. I think around the 17th, 18th, or 19th, Mrs. Peast, who had hired her own private investigator on top of Kozenzak going over to their house every night and like updating them and her cooking him meals and shit, it was completely inappropriate. But I get it why she was doing it. I mean, I'd be doing the exact same fucking thing if it was my kid that had gone missing. You know, I'd be like them like every day, like, where the fuck? You know, what are you doing? What, what, what the fuck have you done today? Like, where, you yeah, know, sure. so which is normal. So I, she has a conversation with Kim Byers and says, look, Kim, I need you to think about every second that you were in that store. Everything like everything matters. I need you to tell me everything that you did again. And I, I keep referencing shit to like our younger audience because shit's so different now back in the old days when you used to take pictures it wasn't with your fucking cell phone all right i mean you used a camera you had film you would take your film you would pull it out and you would deposit it into an envelope you would seal the envelope you'd fill the envelope out and you'd hand it over to wherever you were getting your film developed and you'd tear off a receipt You'd take that receipt and you'd hold on to that. And then in 10 days, two weeks, you'd come back, give them the receipt. They'd give you your pictures. That's how you used to develop film back in the old days. I think that that Kim tells Mrs. Byers, well, you know, I mean, one thing that I don't know that it helps at all, but, you know, I developed some film because like in Cozen's act, like in his book, which I referenced. Yeah, he makes it sound like she did. She already knew it was in his pocket. But yeah, no. Cozen's act claimed in his book that Mrs. Peace told him that she had had a conversation with Kim and that Kim had said that she had developed film and left a receipt in Rob's pocket. That's how the shit goes down. And that, of course, Kim had been wearing the jacket. Rob put the jacket on when he left. And then, of course, the receipt's with him and he gets killed at Casey's house. So the receipt's in his house. So and then it magically turns up at his house. It, it wasn't even ingenious. It was just a, a simple way to create a link between Gacy and peace. So on the 19th, they end up sending two cops over to, to verify. Cause that's how we know that conversation took place. Like late closer to when Gacy's getting arrested, like the 18th or the 19th. Cause on the 19th, first thing in the morning, Cousin Zach tells Adams, I need you to go over to the pharmacy. I need you to grab the log book and I need you to verify that Kim or deposited the film and got the receipt. He brings the entire log book back to the police station. They then bring back a photostatic copy of it to the pharmacy and says here, but they kept the book. At that point, what happens is that so Adams then after he confirms that she did, in fact, turn in film. And I believe it wasn't even on the 11th. I think it was probably on the 10th. But Kim had that receipt. That receipt was never in Rob's pocket. That, like, I believe that she was wearing Rob's jacket. Totally. I think that's where they kind of came up with the idea. Adams calls Kim Byers' house and says, look, we need you to come in. So he calls, talks to Kim's mom. She's at a swim meet. And he writes in his report, which I thought was so telling. He says, I need to talk to Kim about photo receipt number 36119 says it to her like basically saying i need her to bring that <laughs> with her when she comes to the yeah, police basically. department tonight so she ends up going to displays police department on the evening of the 19th with her father i think in that room is cozen zach mrs peace her and her father and i think what they do is they just appeal to her as a human being they say, look, if you want to get the guy who killed your friend, we need that photo receipt. We will take care of the rest of it. And remember, she had given two statements on the 12th. Didn't mention anything about a fucking receipt. Chapstick, though. She mentioned something in his pocket. You know, she mentioned chapstick in his pocket, but not a fucking. But no mention of the receipt. And this that's when yeah. her memory is freshest. It's the very next day, yeah. you know, so. I think they went to her and they yeah. said, look, we need it and we'll we'll handle it. And, and you need to write a statement because the defense attorneys are going to be asking why the fuck you would have put that in there. And instead of her like a normal person, because she had so much pressure on her, she wrote like 12 different reasons of why she might have put it in his coat. Instead of just saying, <laughs> I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't thinking, you know, I was wearing the guy's coat. I fucking tore it off and I stuck it in his pocket. I didn't, you know what I mean? That that's like a normal thing to say. Instead, she had all these yeah. in the entire statement. All it's talking about is the receipt. Nothing else. Not about any of yeah. not about Rob leaving nothing, you know, you know, so it's like and then Kozenzak has to tell his guys on the street something. Ron Robinson, who's the guy who really 
admitted to us and like like completely fleshed out the story that he had pulled Gacy's garbage from the truck after he brought it out to the the curb, which is free game. You're allowed to. Now, there's no expectation of privacy of your shit when it's on the curb. Anybody can get to it. Yeah. So the Kozenzak knows he has to tell the guys on the street something as to how they found this receipt. The problem with it is if you were a, a police officer and you found a receipt from the pharmacy, let's say it happened on the 13th. OK, or or if it happened three days later when they pulled it from the garbage from the truck, they find a receipt from the pharmacy where this kid has gone missing. And, and they all know what a photo receipt is because that was the time. Right. What would be the very first fucking thing that you would do if you had found a photo receipt either in Gacy's inside garbage? Or is outside garbage? What would be the very first thing that you would do? I feel really stupid right now. I don't know. Probably tell your boss, uh, look what I found. Say you're a cop and you're trying to solve a case and you think that this guy has abducted this kid and you are digging around in his garbage and you find a photo receipt from the place where the kid went missing from. The pharmacy. Yeah. Now, the photo receipt doesn't say whose it is. It's just got a number and it has the address of the, the pharmacy and the name. So what would you do? Okay, I found this receipt in Gacy's garbage. Can you tell me who turned the film in? Right? You like that would be the first thing you check uh, I, immediately. Especially a cop. Like, in there's the no 70s way to call people. You know what I mean? It's a different. They drive right to it, probably for sure. They they immediately. So I I asked every cop after the fact. I talked to Mike Albrecht. He said, and I said, Mike, what would have been the first thing that you would have done if you would have found that receipt? And he said, I would have gone to fucking this on pharmacy and see you turn the film in. If it's Gacy, it's not a big deal. If it's fucking Rob Peast, it's a huge deal because it means Rob Peast was there. That right there, the fact that that never happened tells you yeah. all you need to know. But but they needed some way to link Gacy. So they found this fucking receipt and they linked him and then they got to arrest him. And uh, the fucking rest is history, like fucking 36 or 33 right. kids found over like a period of what that fucking weeks they were under this house for they took a break for Christmas, but they're under there for weeks, just finding dead body after dead body months. Yeah, because like they like, you know, they couldn't dig That's outside. Right. That's right. It was yeah. fucking frozen. <laughs> it was like, yeah, the weather was crazy. And, you know, so it's like I think. But they were right. This is what I wanted to talk about today with you. They were right. <laughs> This guy yeah. was a fucking piece of shit. They were. If, if they didn't do this, he might have gotten a couple more. At, at least if he would have ended up winning that federal case and the, the thing would have ended the, like the entire investigation. The first thing that guy would have done is gone down there and fucking concreted the entire fucking crawl space would have poured concrete the next day. Garen fucking teed it, you know. So before they arrested Gacy on the 21st of December, they had already found James Mazzara floating in the river and they found Frank land again, the two last before peace. So it was like 30, 31, 32, 33. So the last four guys or five guys that he killed, he threw in the river because he was out of space in the crawl space. And that was my thing, you know, cause my thing is, is like they planted the evidence. They had no I fucking idea that this guy killed 33 people. None, no yeah. idea. They thought they might have liked him for Zick, the JAS ring, and they might have liked him for Butkovich because they had done enough investigation that knew that these two kids, Butkovich worked for them and vanished off the face of the earth. And Zick was another kid who's, whose parents were all over it. You know, so they, they may have liked Gacy for those two kids. They had no fucking idea that this guy, when they decided to plant the evidence, they were planting it like Stephen Avery you know, making of a murderer style. Like we just want to make sure that we get this guy under arrest because we know that he killed Rob Peast and we don't have the evidence. Can I ask a few questions before we jump into the unethical aspect of this? Okay, a couple right. questions. First thing, are they already operating under the assumption that there is a an offender who is targeting young men and that there is sexual assault and violence or anything like that because of the bodies that had turned up in the river so far? Or is this was this just they thought it was maybe like a single abduction? They thought it was a single abduction. That's why I was saying they might have liked Gacy. They, they definitely thought he was guilty of, of it, at the very okay. least abducting Rob. 
as the days progressed, they then began to believe that he had killed Rob. So yeah, this isn't a fucking BTK where everyone knows. Yeah. And and there's plus there's 30 others missing and nobody really even cares about them. But but this is this is 1978. No one gave a fuck. Like every like kids were is coming out of the 60s. It was like the day that Gacy was arrested was the day that hitchhiking died. Like that was like a real thing in, in the 70s in the United States. Like kids hitchhiked everywhere. Kids ran away all the time coming out of like the 60s and the, the free love and all that shit. It was like a, the mentality of the United States was very different and kids would would run away all the time. Like, I think when I look at the numbers, I think in 1978, there were in just Chicago, there were 44,000 missing persons. Oh, wow. They didn't give a shit at all. I'm going to I'm going to challenge you. I know you're a Gacy guy because you made a whole podcast about Gacy and stuff. Uh, but Kemper, yeah. Kemper was killing people he was uh, picking up on hitchhiking. And when they caught him and found out what he was doing, that's when hitchhiking died. Gacy, get the fuck out of here. He's not a Kemper. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what year was Kemper? I don't know exactly when he was caught, but it was around the same time. It was like earlier, I think. Yeah, no, because like Kem- Kemper did not get the same type of publicity that Gacy did, man. Like, so, like, because like you had in 1972, you had like Dean Coral who had killed 27 boys, very like same MOs as Gacy. Like that's why everyone like that whole. Yeah, we should talk about that after. We should talk about that a little bit after. Uh, I do want to get totally into that a bit because, but well. I, I do think I do think that what they did was fucking wrong to plant them. And they're lucky they got the right guy out of this. But like, it's hard to feel bad that it happened. I do have one more question. You mentioned that the police, the police had just done their fucking jobs. This this could have been avoided. So, I mean, for me, hearing starting at the end the way that we are, because I have only a very rough understanding of Gacy. He gives me the creeps. He really does. I don't like watching documentaries about Gacy. He creeps me out. He's the creepiest of all of them. Like, yeah. I don't find Richard Ramirez half as creepy, creepy as that fan. guy. And that guy's a fucking creep. He is. Mm-hmm. He is. Oh, I don't like the... But the podcast is good because I don't have to look at his fucking face every five seconds, like in a documentary. (laughs) He is the the creep. But okay, (laughs) that's why I call him the creep. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, I mean, this was so fucking transparent. Like this was the Mr. Magoo of fucking abducting a child. Like, it's just like, hang on, mom, you know, your mom, his mom's there because you just fucking saw her in the store. And he's like, yeah, okay, we'll just get in my car. And I'll just take you away and it'll be really obvious that it was me. Like, how could you fucking screw this up any worse than he did? Was he this transparent his entire career? You know what? He was in a lot of ways. He had been approached and looked at multiple times. And again, you have to remember in 1978 that the attitude towards the gay lifestyle was seen as deviant. Okay. It wasn't like everything about like they didn't give a fuck like they were like oh it's a gay on gay crime so who cares these cops all admitted it they were they were like oh you know it was like it was a gay crime it wasn't a real crime it's like that can't be a crime so like that attitude was so pervasive back then casey would say he'd like go to the cops i don't give a shit i want to just tell them it was consensual they're not going to fucking care and he was right like they did not fucking care so ultimately, I think he was tired. It, it's a it's a it's a lot of work to murder people, you know, like in, in that kind of volume, it's going out and trolling and then picking them up. And if he's using formaldehyde on some of them, it's dragging them into the fucking house. It's like killing them, then disposing of the bodies. And it's, it, you know, the guy I've, never slept. I've done a lot to bust a nut, though. You know what I mean? At the in my life, I've done a lot to like come. You know, that's all I want to do is come. So you yeah. do a lot of work afterwards. I just do work right. first. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, <laughs> you know, and there, there's a lot of truth to that, you know, but it, it's like for Gacy, that was kind of like his deal, man. You know, it's like he just wanted to get off, you know, it, whether he snapped into this fucking thing where it was like a rage thing where he was so he felt so terrible based on the way that he was treated by his father as a, as a kind of an effeminate kid growing right. up and his dad just like never showing him any love or affection that that turned him into this fucking like monster that like, as soon as he blew his nut, the only way he could cleanse himself from feeling the way that he was feeling was by 
disposing of the person. The The problem with that theory is that, you know, Gacy claims that he like over that period of time, he probably had sex with a thousand different partners. We know there's not a thousand victims. Why kill some and not kill the other? But I mean, let's be honest. Every single guy inflates. Every guy inflates a thousand. Get the fuck out of here. Gacy. Gacy's like a fucking walking metaphor too, though. I mean, the whole clown get up and everything. He's he's literally a walking metaphor of his own self-image, right? So I get it. Totally. I think he was done. Like, I think he was tired. I, I think because he was so sloppy with peace for exactly what you said, he he knew there is no fucking way that, that that kid walked out of that store that they wouldn't figure out it was him. You know what I mean? There, there was like a 0% probability that they weren't going to, figure out it was him but maybe do you but i mean do you think he was he was like 32 deep in killing and he's like they haven't caught me yet they'll never catch me do you think he just thought maybe he was invincible at this I point think there, i think part of that was it but i i also think that he was tired like i think he was like i'm too fat for this yeah yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I really, he was like, I'm yeah, I'm old. too fucking fat. I'm like, I haven't slept in like six years because it was so sloppy and against his mo. It, it was like he was, he was begging to be caught. It was like the perfect storm, though. But like, because one could arguably speculate that in this case, you know, they happen to have the advantage of this cop's kid knowing this kid, so he's probably thinking. I know this kid. This is a good straight kid. Right. This isn't just some gay on gay bullshit. This is a good straight kid. Maybe we should, right. you know, investigate this a little bit further. Take this a little bit more seriously. Well, it, it, it was only because it was a suburban police department, not Chicago. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was the biggest difference because Chicago that. did not give a fuck. Right. Like I said, they had 44,000 missing kids. Half of them, if not more of them, had just run away and fucking flaked off to California or whatever. This is pre Amber Alert, like Richard kids about Kemper. But I'm telling you, the day that fucking hitchhiking died, the day that kids could say, I'm going out and playing, you know, and mom's like yelling, be back before dark that that day that shit died in the United States. It ended because that story was nationally publicized. You know, it wasn't one of those cases like where. Dean Coral, for whatever reason, was not a national story. It's like Gacy. They had the clown angle. They had like all this shit going on. Well, plus, plus there's photos of him with Rosalind Carter out there. Like, come on, this guy's a, a gold mine right. for uh, uh, any media outlet, right? Totally. Yeah, totally, man. Absolutely. So that that story broke nationally and it changed the way America lived, man. It did. It was like fucking like I. I always refer to Gacy as like a domestic terrorist because he changed the way that we live, like the same way that 9-11 fucking, you know, changed the way that we travel and everything like that. Like TSA didn't fucking exist before. It's kind of preposterous that it took John Wayne Gacy to do that. Like like you were saying, Coral, there was other people uh, that were doing crazy, uh, heinous Dude, shit. Real. And there's a lot to be said about like lead levels in the States in the seventies and shit. Like, I'm not going to get into the, like that part of it, but I mean, uh, there was lots of serial killers active and lots of shit going on. And if it's Gacy, cause he has 33 kids that shit, there was so many fucking scary people, late sixties, early seventies, you know what I mean? And it's just Gacy like, fuck man. Oh, it I took know, you that man. many serial killers to go like, you know what kids come inside before it's dark, you know, shit like that. I don't know. And Darren and I have this debate. This was happening now. How many would he have gotten away with? You know, and I, I'm like a way lower number than Darren is. Like, Darren's like, you yeah. would change his MO. I'm like, yeah. a kid goes missing. We all know yeah. about it. Like immediately. And a white kid, Gacy's victims were all white, right? Yeah. Yes. He wouldn't gotten very yeah, far with strictly white victims. Yeah. You don't nowadays how many cases do you hear of that are more than one white victim anymore not le- a school shooting but not that's many. about it um that's the only thing i can think yeah. of where there'd be that's, more than one yeah, yeah uh, the other question was they were all kids like we're caught talking 15 younger like they were all that young i thought some of them were like 19 20 oh yeah no no the, the range went from i think the oldest victim was 24 or 25 even that's a kid but he, in, in our eyes that's a kid but in the eyes of like the actual what's a kid isn't like that's not a kid that's that's an adult at this point so maybe he would have done that and killed well, more for people. gacy remember i mean the kid had to have hit puberty he you know like the, the the sexual side of it was uh a mandatory part for him you know he had to be able to you know have sexual relations with the kid either performing oral copulation on the kid you know i mean 
So like he, he wasn't targeting younger kids because they hadn't hit puberty yet. You know what I mean? So it was You're like not in court, you can say suck his dick if you want. Like like yeah, I mean <laughs> Yeah, that was that was part of the that was part of the yes judge you know so like yeah he he just like so yeah the age range it was 14 or maybe there may have been a 13 year old in there you know it was all kids that had reached puberty and you know and some of yeah some of them were like a, i'd say a bulk of them were like 17 to, to 20 yeah yeah it's, yeah it's fucking crazy but yeah i i'm kind of with uh i don't want to debate about that part i want to debate about the ethics of this but i at the same time i also want to say this i think that in this day and age, I'm with you. I know how Darren said he was a killer. He had a shitty life and he would have been that no matter what he went definitely the whole nature side of things, nurture side of things. Sorry. I just think that nowadays he wouldn't have had to like be as shy about his like gayness. And he probably would have flourished in a different, like, I don't think he would have done the same shit. He would have just been a normal gay dude is, is your potentially, but, but there's more potential for it. Cause he, it wasn't such like a shame thing as it is back then you know nowadays it's like well that's i like i don't know if you listen to our epilogue after but that's always did, been yeah. my fucking thing like I, i'm like if i th- i totally think that i'm with you that's what i'm saying i'm totally with you i it's just a different like we finally like grown up mentally you know to not give a fuck about what people do in their private lives and to not you know that it's not deviant that people you know can love whoever the fuck they want to love like I, like we're we're slowly slowly getting there as a country, you know, there's still half of fucking America that it's, you know, living in the, the stone ages, but the other half knows what the fuck's going on, you know, and in terms of like, he would not have been made to feel that he was like a fucking deviant, you know, so that like, that's a fact by everyone, you know, his dad might've still been that totally, way, you know, and that would have fucked him up in a different right. way, but he would have had like, he would have went to school as a teenager and like, suck some kid off and been like oh we're boyfriend and boyfriend now just don't tell my dad there would have been that it wouldn't have been every right you know it would have been at home only so yeah but the closer to home it is i think that if that's how he was raised there are plenty of gay people still in the closet there are plenty of hate crimes there are i i, I still think if that's what he was raised like ingrained in him that it was shameful and something that you need to destroy when you're finished with it i don't think a lot would have changed that's probably true because whatever his, you know even if we're changing like the arc of the time his father still would have been raised at the time where you know he would have been raised when gacy was killing you know like his father you know but so are you bob you were raised during that time totally but my dad wasn't a fucking douchebag you know what i mean so it was like you know i was raised like how a kid should be raised can you know <laughs> not be a, a fucking horrible person you can't have a sweet push broom mustache like that and be a douchebag exactly I'll tell you that. exactly <laughs> the nature and nurture thing is so hard to guess because like just if one little situation could make you a completely different person totally if my parents moved me from where i am now in the middle of butt fuck nowhere ontario canada up in the northern fucking regions of the world to like florida just one simple change same family just even the same house it would have been a completely different life you know what i mean like i, I would be a different person for sure i wouldn't want a beer to be too hot it's true <laughs> yeah it's totally it's part of my personality now like it's part of my life so it's like totally fucking just true one little thing yeah i know man i don't know like that's why i feel like i think everything's perfect storm with that guy you know and and like my thing is i just think he killed more than 33 you know i don't i don't think that was it i I agree like i you know there's this gap from 72 to 75 like after he killed his his first victim in 72 that they claim that you know he wasn't active And, and granted he did have you know his mother living with him his wife living with him her two daughters from a prior marriage and his wife, his mother-in-law. So he had like all these people living in the fucking house. So his like opportunity to, to commit the crimes was obviously stunted, but I, that's why I want to do these digs at these different places, man, because it, it was an insatiable craving that he had. And I don't really believe that his first victim was 72. Like, I, I believe that he started killing before that he was doing the same shit in Iowa, same exact games, same the Voorhees kid that he ended up going to prison for is, you know, his father was a legislator. So it's like he fucked with the wrong kid there. You know, like that wasn't the first kid he had done that with. Like I, I ran into this guy who wrote uh, he had written this book about these three boys that went missing in Missouri, like closer to St. Louis, like the mid 60s. Like he then went talked to three different psychics. <laughs> 
from you know all over the country and all three of them and and he never mentioned the name gacy to them when he talked to these psychics and all three of them came to the conclusion that they were all victims of gacy so this guy based on these conversations from these psychics decides to start go digging into it to see if like gacy was down there like during that time frame and he was can i tell you something about psychics these guys are fucking research geniuses okay as soon as they find out what this guy wants to look up they're going to go and then they're going to look at a timeline like what was happening around that time and they go oh gacy wasn't active but he had kills before they would have uh, my guess is they fucking lommed onto the internet figured it out. And they said Gacy just like sensationalized themselves. No offense to that guy. Gacy could have definitely killed him. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not going to take a fucking psychics word. These guys fucking literally do like awesome research, like crazy research. And that's how they go. They have, they're psychics. Yeah. I, I've, I've always just, you know, considered them to be extremely observant people <laughs> who do a lot of research yeah. going well, in, you know? Oh, for sure. They sit, they, they get a guy's name and they have like, I don't know what kind of people these were, but like some places they'll have like a team of five or six people just digging up information around that yep. time. What's going on. And they just come out and go like, I'm wearing a weird hat. So I know things <laughs> from the future. And yeah. you're like, okay, buddy, right. uh, I, I've watched, uh, I've seen these things before. I understand it. I, I, and don't get me wrong. A lot of this shit with the psychics and stuff help a lot of people and make them feel a lot better about what's going on and closure and stuff like that. It's it's a necessary evil. They serve a purpose for some people. I'm I'm with you there. That being said, I mean it's definitely a potential, you know. But I I think AC was killing when he was on the road, man. He traveled all the time, man. And the, you know the only part that makes me think that it would have been tough for him is he didn't have the convenience of the crawl space to dispose of the bodies. Uh, Gacy's a fucking nightmare. Uh, and he probably killed upwards. To th- I, you're right. He was all over the place and he had a big gap in time. He probably started earlier. He's probably 40, 50, honestly. And that's probably where he got the idea for a river when he's all over the place, he just chucks bodies in rivers. Then he went, you know what? My crawl space is filled. I'll start using the river here. Exactly. now. It's good. They got him off the street and I don't like that. They had to fucking frame him up to do it, but I'm not pissed about it. I don't think, I don't think, no, it's not. And like, I'm, I'm pretty clear about that. And when we found out that they had gotten him on framed evidence, you know, Darren and I had some, obviously some long conversations about how to handle it in terms of the podcast, you know, and, and it's, and I'm very clear. I'm no fucking Gacy sympathizer. You know, the guy was the fucking biggest piece of shit on the, you know, on the planet. So yeah, getting him off the streets was absolutely necessary. And I have no problem whatsoever on, on how they ended up doing it at all. What I, what I have a problem with is the fact that it could have gone horribly fucking wrong. They, they could have blown that fucking case to where that fucking guy could have walked like that, that's what I say. It's a cautionary yeah. tale. Like, I think the fact that the number was so huge in terms of victims that it, it made everything that happened in terms of the investigation not really matter because everyone was focused on the fact that this guy was a fucking monster. You know what I mean? So I always talk about like Kozenzak must have been like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. I just, I just stopped like the fucking greatest mass murderer serial killer of all time i'm like I'm, I'm a fucking hero i'm unbelievable you know it's like i'm the greatest human being that's ever lived you know i stopped this fucking guy he didn't know that he was doing that i make that a, a very clear point like kozenzak didn't know it, it, if they had known that he had killed 33 people do i think that if they had to fucking plant some evidence to get him off the street if that would be okay I mean, I can't say no. I mean, they got to stop the fucking guy. It's like, no, but hey, why does it have to be 33? Why does it have to be 33? Why can't it just be Robert? Yeah, Peace? I mean, uh, why can't it just be Robbie Peace? They knew that they knew Robert Peace. They had it. They fucking they were sure. They you were know sure. what I mean? And why does it have to be 33 people for it to be oak? I'm not saying it's OK. That's the thing is like, I'm so torn in between. It's like, I understand it. And I'm not I, if I saw that, I would go like rat on them. I just probably keep it quiet. Like these guys fucking did for four right. years and then tell a podcast when I'm uh, up on my fucking <laughs> crotchety uh, at my old, old folks. Right. Home, when I'm 80, you know, like, come on in. I'm bored. Yeah. I'm right. bored. Come on in, please. Yeah, you, I'll tell you all my Yeah. You want to hear a great story? So, yeah, I think that the, the part of it that we have to remember, had that been discovered that they had done it, he would have walked. You know, that that's the part that's scary. You know, like no appellate court would have been able to uphold that second search when they discovered all those fucking bones. There would have been no way around it other than to throw all that evidence out and the fucking guy would have walked. Yeah. Then you go to plan B. 
You're a bunch of cops. You just follow him around and fucking he'll disappear one day in the pier. I'm sorry, but I mean, they had to do something, man. Right. Come on. They didn't know it was 33, but they knew it was right. one. And that's enough for me. It was certainly enough for Cozen Zach. I think it's a gamble. That's what I think. I think it's a gamble. I think at that point, it's just, okay, we know, we know that this is a guy or we're confident that this is the guy anyway. And basically it's like, okay, we won't be able to get him on this, but he's on our radar now. So potentially we'll be able to get him when there's another victim. So you've basically accepted that the only way to get this guy is to have someone else die. That's not very appealing. Or that this was a one-off thing and he may never right. have another victim and then he'll walk forever. So neither of those options right. are great. Those are both kind of shitty options. If this was on their radar as like a serial killer with a very violent, you know, MO and everything that he was and is, then I think it would be almost irresponsible not to plant the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> but given this one situation it's kind of it's a gray area that i'm not super cool with i'm not i don't like that they had to plant evidence to get him in this situation because it's it just sets a bad precedent it absolutely sets a a, a precedent where if you say it's okay for one then it becomes okay for everybody and it's such a slippery slope exactly that you know people that aren't killing fucking people and they start planting fucking evidence that gets them convicted like say you know, anybody. Those are called black people in America. That's uh, fucking that's, that's no, well, exactly in this right. case, it wasn't. So obviously it's not only black people, Richard. So you should give a shit. Uh, you racist <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm just saying they do that currently now to black people. Well, you know, the whole war on yeah. drugs was to, you know, imprison black people. That's that's yeah. what it was for. Well, there's a difference between planting pot on somebody and planting someone that convicts them of capital murder and puts them to death. It's, yeah, for it's exactly. different, right? OK, let's put it this way. They they plant this evidence and then I'm going to play hypothetical here. So they plant this evidence. They're like, we're going to get away with this. We got this guy. They go search. They find all 33 bodies. Your dad or whomever looks at the, the chain of custody where there was no thing. They go, wait a second, where's the and then they figure right. it out and they get fucked. And then they have then the judge has to make a decision. Do I throw out 33 or 27 or whatever? Uh, but they didn't have the river ones yet. He told them after, right? Like I'm talking about just the Yeah, the the, the crawl space guys. So they would have to throw all that out. You think a judge is gonna throw that out? Like you think a judge hat would have to throw that out, or they'd figure out a way to keep it. The trial court judge, I don't think, would have been the dick. Like, he's like, you know what? He would have told the cops, he's like, this isn't my fuck up. This is your fuck up. I'm not going to fucking exclude it, but I'm telling you when it gets up to the appellate court who has to follow the fucking law, they're going to toss it there because they have to, because it's such a clear, absolute violation of the Constitution. They, they would have had no choice. Could try to make the inevitable discovery argument. None of that shit would have worked, which means that it, the whole case, like even the ones in the river would have, it wouldn't have helped. Everything would have been tossed. It goes back in time. You understand? It's like it, it doesn't work like, oh, well, we found this other shit. So what about that? You know, no, it, it goes back to the time of the search. The last the last legal piece of evidence that you acquired, everything after that gets all fruit of the poisonous tree, all of it. So it's a bad precedent on both ends where it gives you the opportunity to wrongfully convict innocent people, but also potentially set up very guilty people to get away with it if you're caught right so it's just bad it's bad all around i can't i can't stand by what they did the third season darren and i are thinking about doing this case because like one of the people that we became very close to during the course of this podcast is a guy bill dorsch and so bill dorsch was a former chicago cop and in this case that we're thinking about it's not a case it's about 30 cases or more was about a, a chicago cop who was using his confidential informants to close murder cases back in the, like in the eighties where he would get his CIs to ID completely innocent guys over 30 people ended up going to prison. And Bill Dorsch was the whistleblower. Like he, he was, he lives in fucking Bulgaria now because the Chicago police chased him out of, of the fucking country. And these guys are all getting exonerated now. And Chicago just paid out another $20 million. It's on, it's unbelievable. And this guy fucking just kept this cop kept doing it over and over. Dude, it's, Okay, you convinced me. 
You convinced me now because that's that's fucking terrible. It's fucking terrible. Imagine just being me, like Matt, or just walking down the street and some guys like you did it. You're like, what do you mean I did it? I didn't do anything. And then you're in jail for right. thirty years. Yeah, no. Well, because like, good. imagine if Gacy hadn't killed Peace and they had planted that fucking evidence, he would have gone. You know what I'm saying? I mean that. Yeah, Peace turned up two weeks later. I was on vacation. I just drove out to California. Yeah, that would have been bad. Or somebody else fucking killed him or whatever, and they fuck. It's a dangerous game, man. You know, you can't think of it in a vacuum as it just because it worked for Gacy and it got that monster off the street and which was an inevitability he would have been off the street in in a very short matter of time after this yeah because he was losing steam man he just was like he was reaching the end if that's true when he's reaching his end and he's done why is he doing the whole like Jack Hanley thing or the faking heart attacks or like Jack Hanley, just for Celeste's sake and everybody else's sake is like his alter ego who he claimed was the guy who was doing the murders not me officer jack hanley the police officer because it's comfortable because you sit there in a chair nice and cozy and claim that shit <laughs> yeah you know and when i say he's done i think he would have been the one of those guys who like made have like gone quiet for like five or six years and recharged his batteries because he was only 35 or 36 when they got him he might have petered off for a while you know, and you didn't bring up his two his two buddies, Cram and Rossi, who both lived with him in 77 when he was most active. Mike Rossi's driving around in John Zick's fucking car for a year and a half. One of the murder victims. Yeah. You know, Gacy wakes up and he says fucking Rossi's asleep on his couch and fucking Zick's bodies laying in the house. I mean, these guys were I feel pretty confident <laughs> saying that I. I feel they're complicit. I feel that they were involved. Which one committed suicide in 2001? Was it Rossi? Cram. Cram. So did you guys try and reach out to Rossi? He's still around. He's still got a Oh, yeah. Do for the podcast? Yeah. Did he, did he even message you back or anything? Many people have tried to reach out to him, but he uh, he wanted 50 grand to come on and deny everything. I'll pay you 50 grand for you know if you come on and fucking admit what you did i'm not gonna pay you know come in and just be a lying piece of shit like i know you're going to be we were pretty clear about that right like they were living with gacy while he was yeah you said that like fucking of course they were doing something they must have seen at least something of course the guy killed everybody at like three four five in the morning these fucking guys were living there dude they all were killed in his house how could they not have known do you think some of them were them though they got into it and then they started killing and Gacy was like, what are you doing? You can't kill people in my house. 100%. This is not how we do this. You think they're Absolutely. doing it? Yeah, I do too. I totally think they're part of it. Totally. I think it was like a weird kill gang. They got off on it. They probably fucked around the dead bodies. They're fucking weird people. So you never know. And I think that Cram hanging himself. I think it finally fucking like it got to him. Well, they keep, uh, that's the other thing. They keep talking about drugs. Like what drugs were these guys doing? Just weed? No, like Gacy was a big Valium guy. Like it was all prescription shit. Probably like Quaaludes, you know? Yeah, a lot of weed. Because you have to think about like Cram and Rossi because they fit his like kill profile. You know, they were exactly the type of kids that he would typically kill. What yeah. made them different to the point where not only did they survive, but they fucking lived with them. There were too many stories from people coming forward about how they escaped from Gacy or Gacy let them go where they were like, there were two guys. It wasn't just this one guy. There was another guy there. Like fucking the Jeff Rignall guy was very clear that when he finally woke up out of, you know, one of his formaldehyde stupors that he was in that, you know, some guy with long brown hair was blowing him. There, there's too many stories about Gacy picked him up and some kid was like a young guy was driving the car and Gacy was sitting in the back like some super fucking creep cracking like super creepy fucking jokes and like cackling and his like little lackey fucking weirdo is sitting up in the front seat and like, <laughs> you know, like every time Gacy, it's like nightmare <laughs> scenario, man. It's like, yeah. And then, okay. This is an interesting thing. When Rossi was getting, he was getting questioned, I guess, at the trial, he had like this fancy ass lawyer. He's just a little poor kid, right? He had this fancy ass fucking lawyer. Why do you think what's going on there? Something he could not afford himself. No way. What turns out happening is that um, Mike Rossi's grandfather was a guy named Mazzullo, who was old man Daly's right hand man. Who's old man Daly? Uh, Richard Daly was the Chicago mayor. There you go. <laughs> He's one one voice away from the mayor. He literally was. And, and that is so real that when Kozenzak wrote his book, he used a pseudonym for Rossi. Like, I, I couldn't fucking believe it. Terry Sullivan in his book, he used a pseudonym for Rossi. Like the guy was still protected when 
when I was first bringing out the podcast, because my dad is talking about Cram and Rossi all the fucking time in the tapes. My dad was all over the. So the NBC News in Chicago came and they said, look, our legal department won't let us mention Mike Rossi's name. Wow. The, the guy's still fucking somehow protected, man. It's so fucking weird, man. This is where I was going to bring up the whole Dean Crawl thing. Uh, this is how this start. This kind of stuff starts to connect, right? With the the Candyman and the fucking the that uh, documentary, the yep. clown on the Candyman. That's what it's called, right? Yep. This ends up being like this weird child trafficking ring that they would find these kids, like Cram and Rossi. I'm assuming would be uh, these kind of kids who would go and find kids for people like Dean Kroll or John Wayne Gacy and bring them to their house to be molested or and then maybe potentially killed and stuff like that oh like jeffrey epstein exactly like exactly like epstein exactly 100 percent like epstein in fact epstein might even have his finger this might be all connected to all this at the same time which makes it even crazier it's true though and like my my dad like in the tapes and i think we played that portion like gacy brings up coral and he's like oh because one of the one of the cops was big on like gacy was somehow connected to coral i think it was this sergeant lang who wouldn't come on the show but i had a can we pause just like for two seconds for the dum-dums in totally. the room who is that dean coral is another serial killer uh he was working out of i forget what state he was houston in. Down in Texas. Wouldn't he? He like worked in a candy store or some shit like that. And he'd lure kids in there and like kill them in his candy store. And he had like this torture board. These kids would be like tied up to his fucking. He was he was like a sadist, a big time sadist. And he would kill kids like at the store. Right. Am I wrong about this? His family made candy. So he did have the torture board, which Gacy had as well. Like they had he had that fucking same board. That was the board that Rignall yeah. was stuck to, you know, like had the rope and you put your fucking like tied your arms to the rope. He had two accomplices. He used the rope trick to fucking kill the kids. The rope trick for everyone who doesn't know, it's like a garage. He would just wrap a rope around their neck and he would take a stick or something and twist it and twist it until they fucking die. Like, right. Just basically pop their head off like a yeah. fucking, like, not a good way to die. No, <laughs> not, not even a, close. Not a good way to die. They overlap by one year, I think, because one of Dean Coral's accomplices ended up killing him. He shot him um, yeah. in 73. And. Uh, so Gacy and him overlapped in terms of at least what we know activity wise. Uh, but yeah, there, there's a lot of dudes that this, uh, this Paskey guy who was real tight with cram was another fucking super creep. And he was likely connected to this John David Norman guy who was a known child trafficker. Like he had, cabinets like filing cabinets filled with documents relating to kids that he was fucking like trafficking like 30,000 kids he was there was a direct connection from Paskey to Cram and then Cram to Gacy the documentary that was most recently released and it happened to drop right before I dropped the podcast was called Devil in Disguise on Peacock and like I, I was, you know, I talked with Tracy Ullman a lot and she was huge on that angle. She was like, that was her whole fucking thing. She was like, this guy was, he was part of this much bigger sex trafficking ring, you know, and like all the politicians and the higher ups that like Gacy was fucking hanging around with and had coming to his parties. You know, she was like all over that NBC ended up editing like a huge amount of that content out. So she was super pissed off. Because she gave me everything that she had eight years of research yeah. when I told her I was doing the podcast. She's like, well, as long as you're trying to get to the truth, I'm, I'm a fact driven guy. You know, as much as I might think that that might be a thing, I don't dismiss it at all. However, I don't know how I'd ever prove it. Yeah, you'd have to get someone like uh, Rossi to admit to it, which you'll never fucking do. Totally. Right. With me, like speculating, like I, I know the, the receipts planted and I. I kind of bring it to the next thing where I say, well, that's a fact in terms of what I believe happened with buyers. I can't prove it at this point, but I could at some point if I get Kim Byers to just fucking come on the, the pod. Yeah. Should I should I try and call get get in contact with Kim Byers? Say like this Bob Mata guy is saying a bunch of shit about you. I'm called unethical podcast. Let's call him out. Let's call him out on I, the podcast. <laughs> I did. I did. Like at the end of episode, whatever it was, you know, I'm like paging Dr. Kim Byers. Not not that Bob. Bob, what I'm saying is I'm going to call you an enemy of mine and let's fucking bury this asshole and then trick her to get on. I love it. <laughs> I fucking love that this, idea. I love that. This idea. Bob guy is spreading fucking rumors about you and yeah. then she'll pop in and I'll just ask her. Like, I think you, you should hundred percent do that. I think you should hundred percent do that. That would be fucking amazing, man. 
Like I am a hundred percent down with that plan. A hundred percent down with it. Fucking hey, yeah, that would be amazing. So, but yeah, no, we're we're not going to not do part two of the Gacy thing. We're doing that, but I'm doing the Garcia case like for the second season then because we need time. Yeah, of course, you, a lot of stuff to vet on that one. Yeah. Yeah, like, well, like we're, we're definitely going back to it. I, I'm excited for your season two and I'm excited for season three. Now I, uh, I only have a couple more questions. Like my God, Bob, you know, so much, it's hard for me to not just like yeah. bounce off your question and then go off on a tangent. Yeah. It's hard not to, to go off on tangents, man. <laughs> Celeste, do you have more questions before I got a couple stupid questions at this point? I have questions that are just for my entertainment more than anything. <laughs> I mean, I have questions for sure, but I really just want to listen to the podcast now that it's now that the season's done. Yeah, Celeste, here's what we do, Celeste. When you're done with the pod, I'll come back on. (laughs) So I can just be like, okay, 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 okay. So episode four, you said this. Right, because, dude, I'm telling you, man, it's a fucking, like, you'll definitely have shit you want to talk about. Do a bonus with Bobby. I will for sure. But, you know, like, I want all the listeners to hear this and be intrigued and come listen with me. And then now that all our listeners have listened to it, now we can actually talk without having to explain everything right. to them. And then we'll have that context and we're good to go. I really want Bob podcast to catch on so people can understand what happened here. And I was playing devil's advocate. Of course you shouldn't plant fucking evidence, but I mean, at the same time, it's fucking, it's John Wayne Gacy. Like fuck that guy. Right, you can't, you can't argue with the result. Yeah, Get that fuck off the fucking streets. Get that asshole off the street. It's a legitimate fucking like it. Like- I think, the most shocking thing about this entire case is that that man was only 30 fucking yeah. five. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is a haggard looking yeah. man. That's a motherfucker who never sleeps. That's what you look like. Yeah. You know, I mean, that. I thought he was easily yeah. going on 50. Easily. I thought, yeah. I thought he was like, in his I 40s too. I thought he was in mid 40s. I didn't know he was 30s when until I looked into it. I literally like he's got to be at least 45, you know, but nope. Young. Younger nope. than me at this point now. So a couple things here. These are going to be non sequiturs because they kind of didn't really fit into my narrative here, but I really wanted to get uh, your idea on the, the whole Dean crawl coral thing and uh, all that stuff. But there's also, okay. How, how close there's still five unidentified victims. And I kind of want to mention that in here to just to get that out there. There's still five people. They have no fucking clue who they are, but they found bones for right. remains, I guess. And I know they, they re- that was six until about a year ago, right? Less than a year ago. They Correct. identified one. There was like we were in the middle of the pod when they identified one of them. And like Darren and I snuck into the, the, uh, the press, press conference. Release, yeah. Like I'm asking questions and shit. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, Bob Mata from Defense Diaries. Uh, you know, I'm like, we did. We literally snuck into the fucking That's uh, thing. But you know, you, you act like you you belong. You know what I mean? Exactly. That's how you fucking sneak into shit like that, you know. So yeah, no, there, there's there's five and like my biggest question with that is why the fuck don't they just give like DNA Doe project is the one who identified him and they did amazing work. And I'm super tight with them now because I reached out to them right away. I'm like, that's fucking amazing. It's like, we really, part of what we wanted to do with this podcast is help people get closure and get these, these five victims identified. So they have names and so they can be memorialized properly. And why don't they just give them the fucking DNA? So they can do what they fucking do. Like what, like, what is the holdup, man? Like, I just don't fucking get it. Okay. Wait, sorry. Who's they're They're not getting, they're not getting DNA from the the police. No. And and like, you know, and they keep coming up with like bullshit excuses that, you know, like it's so degraded, but like the technology that they have now with these DNA, like there's like this uh, David Middleman, who's got like DNA solves. There's so many companies out there that have advanced the technology so much that they can take a completely degraded piece of DNA because they're, they're doing, it's like a combination of it's familial DNA, right? Yeah it's, yeah. it's genealogical DNA shit, man. And they're, so they're looking at family trees and once they, and, and kind of the way it works. And in one of the episodes, we kind of get into it because I called um, Karen, who was my contact at DNA Doe, and I wanted her to explain like how, how they went about it. And yeah. And she did a really good job. Yeah. She does a great job, man. And it's like, you, you know, they got two different databases. You got the criminal database and then you got the, you know, when people are doing like 23 and me or unfortunately you have to like upload your own or give release to be able to upload. That's just the way exactly. it is right now. Exactly. I, I, Cause like in, yeah. CODIS is like all the criminal shit. Law enforcement doesn't have access to that. So you need these companies and like these non, not for profits that are doing this 
to go and like so they're like okay we have a profile we're gonna upload it into like name us and see if we get fucking hits on that and if we do and if we can build a, a family tree off of it because like somebody is uploaded and we found okay boom we, we found a line here so now we're gonna go we're gonna work backwards from that line and like where was this kid like was it could this kid have been in this place we're gonna build the timeline back and then we go to, to law enforcement and say okay we got a fucking hit and then they and then they'll look through codis to, you know so it's like it's right there for them. Like the answers are going to come. I, I just don't understand what they're waiting for. Yeah, and that's man. good, it's right? I, I'm glad that you're still in contact with this. Uh, what's the place called again? I want to shut them out a little bit. Uh, DNA Doe Project. And they do. A I love shit. this this gene, uh, familial DNA shit right now. Uh, they're going to get less. Amazing. They're going to get less because of it. I know it. They're going to catch list. Uh, they're going to catch. Yep. Uh, or they got fucking the little jack off guy who's jacking off in front of everyone. I forgot his name. Golden State. They caught him. They're, they're doing yep. a lot of crazy stuff with this. And if they can identify these last five, I'd be very happy. Me too, man. Okay. Two more questions. After finding out what you found out about the planning of the evidence, uh, did you think about going and taking a quick look at Kozenzak's past and seeing if there's anybody that maybe he fucked over? 100%. You went? Did you, totally. Did you see anything? Totally. Did you get anything? Any well, we, we didn't do it. Like we didn't dig in. We didn't have the time, man. Cause like we were producing the podcast, like on the fly. It's like Darren says in the epilogue, it's like when you hear a fucking interview of somebody like on the pod, we interviewed them like that week. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? It I, was like, it was so much yeah. fucking work and we had so much pressure. I feel but- that brother. Let's do it this way. Let's, let's do a little bit, something else. Joe Kozen, Zach, he was uh, chief of uh, the plain police for, I don't know how many years, 20, 20 years after that long time. Yeah. yeah. So maybe there's a lot of podcasters out there. There's a lot of people out yeah, there who like to serve. Let's go, uh, maybe go look and see if Kozen, Zach fucked someone and let us know. I don't know if maybe there's a guy totally. in prison right now that Joe Kozen, they swore up and down Joe Kozen, Zach fucking threw him under the bus. Let us know. Let somebody know. Right. 100 percent and and darren position is like he did so well with planning this evidence in terms of how he got it in there's no fucking way that was the first time the guy did it yeah. you know that's darren's logic behind it yeah. and he's not wrong i don't want you to we're called unethical i don't mind uh i don't want you to have to tell people to go looking for it but i mean if it happens to come around go talk to bob he will do something about that i'm sure of it right 100 percent all right absolutely now after all this and i asked you this question we were my first basically my first question for you was your dad your, is your hero so after all this what does he think of the podcast like what did he what was his revel when you had the revelation what did he say was he pissed that he didn't know at the time did he like you know what, I mean? what, what was his reaction he was kind of stunned like he like he didn't get it it for like i had to break it down the way that i broke it down in the podcast for him to understand like he didn't know what i, I meant he's like what do you mean He's like, I'm like, well, they fucking planted that that photo receipt. It didn't exist. And like, he's like, well, it's like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, he like, so it, first of all, my father has not listened to the podcast because he's old and he doesn't understand how podcasts work. And I'm super offended by it. <laughs> like, I'll just, I'm like, I'm like, dad, if I wrote a fucking love me, book, dad, why don't you love me? Listen to yeah, I'm like, dad, if I wrote a fucking book like about this, would you read the fucking book? He's like, of course. I'm like, well. Okay, I wrote a fucking book, except it's an audio book. Listen to the fucking podcast, man. I'm like, are you serious? After all that time, you're still trying to aspire for he's still your hero trying to get to him and he won't even do it. He won't even give you this one last thing. Oh, my God. Well, exactly. What I I ended up figuring out is that when I explained it to him, that's when I realized because I like early on. And I know, Richard, when you were listening to it, I was like. I just don't get how my dad missed this. It's like he's too thorough of a lawyer. Like it was. So evident to me when I'm looking at Humbert's like that, the evidence tech, his report from the search on the 13th, it's clear the fucking photo receipts not on the goddamn list. And this guy was like, it was a bulletproof list. He took pictures of everything. He listed everything, you know, and it's, it's not there. And Humbert comes on and says, look, he's like, I, I can't tell you definitively one thing or the other. All I can tell you definitively is if the evidence was there. I would have fucking put it on the report and I would have taken a picture of it, period. End of story. What what ends up happening is that I realized that what happened is the state just never tendered those evidence logs. Like I should have never have gotten those. Those weren't supposed to be still in circulation. Like I would have ended up getting them anyway, because when we went to go interview the main digger of the crawl space, that Dan Gent, uh, Gentry guy, 
who was the main digger, he had all the original sheriff's reports. Cause remember it was a different agency. He, he was like an outside guy. Yeah. Right. It was Cook County Sheriff. So, so what happened is like Kozen's act just like, boop, pick those fucking, those two fucking things out. He picked out like my dad, they didn't know Humbert existed ever. Like no one ever, like I asked Humbert on the, the pod. I'm like, did anyone ever follow up with you? Anyone from the state, either Kunkel or anyone? He's like, no, I never heard from anybody again. And now we know why, you know, so Kozenzak pulled those out. So when Cook County sent those over to Desplaines and then Desplaines puts the discovery package together to send to the state, because that's how it works. You know, it's not magic. It goes from it goes from the reporting agency who would be yeah, of, course. of course, anybody yeah. that they bring on to help. They are getting those reports before the state does. So Cook County would have sent and they did send all their reports over to Desplaines. Kozenzak, of course, is the lieutenant handling the case. He looks through him. He pulls out Humbert's report that never gets tendered to Kunkel. Kunkel doesn't withhold it. Kunkel didn't have it because when we went and had Kunkel read his entire closing argument, man, like I asked Bill, Bill had not listened to the pod, but he knew he had heard about what was going on. And I'm like, you know, cause I like Darren and I was like, is Bill going to talk to us anymore? <laughs> you know, is Bill going to be super pissed, you know, and, and Bill wasn't, and Bill did not deny any of it. Like, he's like, I, I, I don't have knowledge of it, but I can tell you that fucking cousin Zach was a shady motherfucker. You know, and that was coming from Bill Conkle, you know, and like everyone after the facts are talking about how much of a lone wolf and how weird Cozen Zach was. To me, Cozen Zach is like the hero and the goat all wrapped up into one. Maybe he you know? framed like, Gacy. Maybe he was putting them. Under yeah, <laughs> I mean, he, he did frame him. It just so happened that he was right. No, but maybe he, maybe he framed Gacy with the murders. He was putting them under the whole yeah, time. I mean, Jack that, Hanley that, is Cozen Zach. <laughs> now that would make for a hell of a fucking podcast it's just i would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for you unethical guys <laughs> i think that sounds like a private dick yeah, exactly episode, man, if i don't say so myself exactly. okay so that's cool I, I i just wondered about your dad i was just curious how he took the whole thing he doesn't even listen to it so that makes sense aspire to be him you'll never get there no two exactly. two quick things so uh they put Gacy down, what, the 82? 94. 94, that's right. It was like fucking super lots after that. So that's right. Oof, I was yeah. one. Uh, but yeah, 94 and his last words were kiss my ass. Kiss my ass for his last words. There's some debate about it, but I like to think that they were. Kunkel says nothing happened, right? Kunkel said right. nothing. There's no no words spoken. Yeah. I do like that. And then his last meal was what? A bunch of KFC? KFC, fried shrimp, strawberries. Fucking weirdo, man. Have you ever closed your eyes? This is my last question, by the way. Have you ever just closed your eyes and just pictured John Wayne Gacy 10 o'clock at night, let's say, after his KFC is closed and he sent all his employees home and there's just that one extra bucket of chicken? And he just fucking smashed that entire extra bucket of chicken just on the spot. He guaranteed he ate the whole bucket. And just to see how greasy his fat fucking face was after that and how p- much pleasure he got oh, from yeah. that. Like, have you ever thought about how much, how happy he was? To oh, my God. Well, well, I hadn't before. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, I have. And the fact that he asked for it as his last meal speaks volumes, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. He owned three of them. You figure you'd be sick of it. That's what I fear. He must have eaten a pound of fucking chicken a night. What a fat <laughs> fuck. And I, I'm glad he's dead. I, I'm glad uh, they injected did lethal injection. Apparently that sucks. Yeah. I wish they videotaped some of these so you could watch it and go like, ha ha, yeah. fuck face. And Good riddance. times, you know, just rewind it. But <laughs> uh, all we got was that. And I'm glad he's gone. And you know what? The fact that he said, kiss my ass makes it all that much better. He, uh, I want to end this the same way you ended yours. Fuck, kiss my ass. You piece of shit. I hope you die. <laughs> That's right. Oh, he was already dead. <laughs> kiss my ass. That's right. Fuck that guy. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. I, are you glad to be done? With I him? am, dude. Real that though? was uh, that was a taxing nine months, dude. To you know, like aside from the work side of it, but yeah, there there was a kind of a like a real cathartic aspect to it of like because it's been a part of my life in a fucking weird, super weird way forever, man. I got a weird question for you uh, that I just thought of now. Do you think your kids are getting the whole Gacy thing that you got when you were? Yeah, you know what? That's a great fucking question. Like, so my 16 year old has not listened to it, who played the part of Kim Byers twice on the podcast, still has not listened to her father's podcast. I'm like, you're 
I'm like, you're an asshole, Cameron. I'm like, how the fuck can you not listen to my podcast? <laughs> the fuck is with you, man? And then I'll get to it. There's my favorite murder episode. Yeah. I listen to. And then my my nine year old <laughs> who I know would listen to it is like Allison won't let her listen because she's too young. You know what I mean? So it's like, uh, but yeah, you know what? That's a legitimate question. And I, I feel like I think you're right, man. I think like uh, extended the life of the Gacy case in the Mata lives by like another generation. Thanks, dickhead. Like, I didn't even think of that till now. <laughs> <laughs> are you gonna burn the tapes no one will get these tapes there is no There's more, no podcast. more pod. yeah fuck dude it? yeah i didn't even yeah. think of that yeah I, i've i've now just created that gacy is now a part of their lives for like the next whatever man so sorry yeah. there's a new new conversation for the therapist i guess thanks bob we took up fucking lots of your time buddy we took a uh, two and a half hours oh uh, well i love you man i appreciate course, that dude I could, I could honestly talk about this all day long, but I don't want to, uh, people need to listen to your podcast. It's defense diaries. Bob Mott is the host. Darren, uh, Darren Wood is a phenomenal executive producer and I'm glad to have met you guys both. Likewise. And I'm glad that you guys or our podcast, my uh, on private dicks, you've been on that. Plus you've been on this. So you've been on both the podcasts and I'm glad that you're a part of our unethical family. I'm glad yeah. you have me, man. You know, we'll be podcasting together for a long time, oh, brother. Dear. So Celeste, do you have any parting words for Bobby? No, man. Just that I'm looking forward to binging your podcast. Now that it's finally done. I'm going to get started on that right away here. I'm hopefully we didn't ruin some of it for you. Celeste, I feel bad. I, f- I feel like we were like, we were like, I'm right into this. And you're like, I haven't listened. I feel bad. I feel like I fucking took over. Well, no, because I was sitting here as somebody who hasn't listened to the podcast, which a lot of our listeners are going to be. That's good. I was engaged with everything that was going on and like it piqued my interest, right? Like you're on my, you know, you've been on my list, but it's always like, oh, I have this to do. I have that to do. But now I'm like, it's, it's only nine. I could probably pump out a couple episodes before I go to bed. <laughs> You know? His first episodes are about a half hour to 45 minutes long each, and then they just get longer as you go. So you'll get through the first 10 and no problem. <laughs> <laughs> and the f- the first 10 is where the cover up is, and then it just continues the timeline. But I mean, the first 10 are like what I could call the crazy. I was like, holy fuck, after like eight or not, or seven or eight, I can't remember which one, where you're like, they just planted. I'm like, everything you just yeah. said makes sense. What the fuck? I, I've been listening to him for years and I've listened to yeah. Casey shit like a hundred times. He just fucked. He broke it. He broke the whole story. It's awesome. Yeah. Richard's like a hardcore fanboy for you. He all the, he talks about you all the time. It's true. He's what? like, I, I love Bob Mata. Bob Mata's well, I, love like, him, I hope man. Bob Mata's proud of me I t- all the time. <laughs> I am fucking so proud of him. I, I, oh, I, I love you all, man. Like a, like a yeah. ton, like seriously though, you know, it's like you guys were, I think you guys were literally my first like podcast yeah. homies. Like you guys like truly were. And I can't even remember, like, I, I think Richard and I just like, I saw you on Facebook saying I have tapes and I, I told the girls right away, I'm messaging this fucking guy. Cause I know this is going to be amazing right away. And I wasn't wrong. He did immediately. He was like, this guy's on Casey tapes. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm messaging this guy because if you start a pod, we just yeah. started one. We need to start talking to people. And this guy I'm interested in because I love, like, I've, I'm into true crime. Like I am, I have been forever. And Gacy, come on, you got firsthand. I'm talking yeah. to this guy. I need to. And then you're nice enough to talk to us. You could have just blown me off. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're, you could have, ah, you could have, it's not, you wouldn't be the first podcaster to blow me off. Trust me. Wait, that sounded wrong. Yeah. I, I like to think that I'm a, a fucking pretty decent human being, but you know, it's like, I'm, I'm better off for it, you know, cause when I blow off fucking somebody, then I don't have the opportunity to meet them. You know what I mean? So like, I'm not, I'm not the blown off type. So it's like, you know, that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So, you know, and, and we'll be, we'll be fucking around together for a long time. That's dude, so, you know, and I'm, I'm happy about it. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening to another episode of Unethical Podcast. If you're not in the Facebook group, stop being such a silly goose and come find us at Unethical, the official Unethical Podcast group. If you find you just can't handle the anticipation until the next episode, then it's a great time to join our Patreon, where we have a ton of extra unethical content, and of course, our brother podcast, Private Dicks. And in case you didn't hear the good news, Private Dicks is now Public Dicks. Every two weeks, an episode of Season 1 will drop wherever you eat your podcasts, and our lucky Patreon patrons are literally living in the future, listening to new episodes from Season 2. On the fence about it, have a listen to the trailer and see what you think. 
If you've got a case, big or small, give the private dicks a call. And yes, the phone number is real. Enjoy! Have you got a mystery that needs solving? Where is Amelia Earhart? We know. Who the hell was D.B. Cooper? Bah, easy. Bermuda Triangle? Probably solve that one next. Here at Private Dicks, we guarantee a mystery solved every episode. That's with a capital G. Every second Friday, the Private Dicks take a client, record their session, and solve the world's greatest mysteries. One by one. Private Dicks solve them, no problem. God, I love just crushing mysteries. Search up Private Dicks on your favorite podcatcher and you can solve a mystery too. The mystery of what's your favorite podcast? It's Private Dicks. Another one solved. If you have a mystery to be solved, call 1-855-PRVTDIX. That's 1-855-PRIVATE-DICKS. Call 1-855-PRIVATE-DICKS and leave us the rundown of the case. Maybe the Dicks will solve it. It's 855-PRIVATE-DICKS. Cause I'm straight when it comes to humans, but fucking gay from old people.